Good morning. This is the public hearing of March 5th, 2019. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Glenn. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chen. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldwood. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Clifford Smith. Commissioner Lutfi. Here. Commissioner Shemir Here. Commissioner Maltz. Here. Good morning, Commissioners. We're, uh, we're going to start today's Preservation Department agenda with uh, public meeting items. The first is item number one, LBC 19-35199, an application for a binding report for a Manhattan Block 127 Lot 1, 476 Fifth Avenue, the New York Public Library, individual and interior landmark. Those are style of library program designed by Carrera Hastings and built from 1898 to 1911. The application is to modify modify the incision window openings, modify the loading dock perimeter wall, demolish mechanical pin tiles, relocate architectural features, construct a new plaza, and install light fixtures and inscriptions. Uh, this was presented at the public hearing on February 19th, 2019. No action was taken at that time. Good morning, commissioners from the official preservation staff. The application before you is 476 Fifth Avenue, the New York Public Library, which is an individual landmark located on Fifth Avenue between 40th and 47th Street. Application was first presented at the public hearing on February 19th for no action was taken. The proposal is to create a new plaza which will extend to the west on 40th Street and install a new door opening, engravings, and light poles within the new plaza. The proposal also includes modifying the loading area and perimeter wall on 40th Street and installing new light poles adjacent to the loading phase. At the public hearing, some commissioners expressed concerns with the proposal, including the planter at the new plaza and the lighting system. Applicants have returned with a revised proposal addressing these comments. Representatives from the Municipal Library and Fireman, Linda Ballard. Oh, can we have a motion to open the proceeding? And all in favor? Good morning. I'm Iris Weintraub and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the New York Public Library. I want to thank you again for carefully considering our proposal to widen our loading dock and add a public entrance and plaza on the 40th Street side of our iconic 42nd Street Library. We greatly appreciate the detailed review of our plans at the last hearing and the feedback that you provided. As for that feedback, we have made alterations to our plans that we believe address the issues raised around the terrace design and the lighting. We believe that these changes, which you will hear about in more detail shortly, do enhance the overall design and thank you again for informing and considering them. We have also addressed issues involving the name of the plaza and the prominence of the donor's name. As you know, prior to philanthropy, always been and remains a critical part of the library's story and we are so grateful for the transformative gifts and support that we receive. That support over 124 years has allowed us the best to serve the people of the city. So it clearly is very important to us. But we are all in full agreement that the size and placement must be appropriate. In that same vein, I want to take a moment to address questions that have come up about the name of the building, specifically the library's proposal to add the name of the building to the 40th Street side. We are proposing a new public entrance. We believe it needs to be accompanied by the building's formal name, the Stephen and Schwartzman Building. Visitors need to know where they are, so it's important to add the name, and we are proposing doing so using the same understated treatment found elsewhere on the building. Additionally, at the time of Mr. Schwartzman's gift, still the largest in the history of the library, and one that will strengthen the library for years to come, we agree that the name would be on all public entrances subject to the landmark's approval. We would, of course, like to honor that 11-year-old woman while also clearly labeling a new entrance. It's important to note that had this entrance been in existence in 2008, the name would have been added to it. While we understand the concerns about the name, we also think it's important to remember the big picture. This project to add a public entrance and terrace 
to the 40th Street side of the building will better connect our historic building to the community, make the library's collections, exhibitions, and programs more welcoming and accessible to the public, improve circulation for people and books throughout the building, and increase outdoor public space. The improvements are part of an overall master plan for the library that will increase public space, add exhibition spaces, and double the number of seats for researchers. Additionally, right inside the new 40th Street door will be an education center where students who perhaps never visited the building before will learn how to work with primary sources and be taught the importance of research and fact-finding. All of this work is crucial for better serving the public now and in the future. As such, we're excited about this project and greatly appreciate your time and consideration. Yes. Good morning. I'm Stephen McHale, Fireman Bell, representing the design team, which also includes the Common Architects, uh, uh, in partnership with Landscape uh, Architects as well. This is Libra, who presented to you uh, the last occasion we were here, since I apologize. Um, I'd like to thank also the commissioners for the clear feedback that we were given at the last hearing. Um, specifically, we were asked to reconsider the plans are completing the design of the proposed 40th Street Terrace, to review the lighting design at the loading dock, um, in particular the number of poles that were being used. And there's one other item that we would like to update you on, which was a tweak to the location of the light poles proposed along the 5th Avenue Plaza. So to remind you of the scope of work included in the application, um, it all um, takes place on the 40th Street side of the building, which is the side of the, um, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, um, that we noted was the more service-oriented side of the building in our previous presentation. Purely for reasons of organization, we've broken this down into three parts. The first being a uh, uh, minor relating of Fifth Avenue Plaza, and we'll talk about the lighting there. The second part, as we move west, being proposed terrace, um, entrance, new public entrance in 40th Street, and the third part being um, improvements to the loading of the area. Um, and again, just as a reminder, on the left you can see the 5th Avenue Plaza, as we call it. In the center section, you see the um, Milford Pink Granite Street Wall, behind which is the top portion of a double height mechanical space that which um, would be lower to create the plaza behind that wall. And on the right hand side, you see the existing loading dock behind the wall as a secondary loading dock. Looking at the Fifth Avenue Plaza in particular, um, our goal is, as I mentioned last time, is to remove the step where the plaza meets Fifth Avenue for accessibility reasons, to replace the grates um, over the fringe areas so that they can be immediately compliant. And we would like to add lighting for reference to the photo um, from the Fifth Avenue Plaza on the right hand side, where you can see at the right hand edge of the picture one of the original historic um, light fixtures, and you can also see. Um, if I can figure out how to work the pointer. Um, one of the uh, new light poles, which was approved and installed in 2010. Here we can see the plan of the Fifth Avenue Terrace section. So the Fifth Avenue on the, uh, beg your pardon. The Fifth Avenue on the right hand side of the page. Um, the existing uh, up above, just for reference, uh, the trees are not shown on the existing, the trees are existing. And the colors in the bottom, there's, as you see, very little change, really, except for some minor here here. And two light poles. These had previously, in our last application, been located in the planter to the west side. Um, investigations into the conditions of the roots of the trees um, suggested much better to locate them on the north side. And in doing so, they were able to flank the steps as they lead up to the rest of the fifth avenue terrace and align them so that they are centered on solid portions in the balustrade that is now marks the edge of the upper terrace. Moving on now as we head westward um, towards the location of the 40th Street Terrace. Um, we 
see here at the ends of what we're going to pick up in a stone bench, uh, and beyond that stone bench is the and uh, the previous um, hearing we showed these two plans side by side, noting the asymmetry in the sort of site work and landscape treatment between 40th and 42nd streets facades. Um, and here you can see in the proposed view on the right how uh, the new terrace will extend the green buffer alongside the south side of the building and as it um, leads people towards the new entrance that will take place here. One other point to note on this elevation is, uh, or a very green line site down here, is how square motifs have been ganged together in the Fifth Avenue Terrace and how they have been aligned with the sort of architecture of the facade of the Fifth Avenue. Um, in the previous uh, iteration, um, we included a counter centrally located within the terrace, which, um, upon review and uh, based on comments of the Commission, has been removed. Um, and in its place, we have taken the square bluestone paving motif from the fifth, uh, from the fifth Avenue Plaza and reused that in the new proposed terrace, um, whereas previously they were engaged benches connected to the plant, the benches are now uh, standing. Um, you can see there is a threshold condition here uh, which allows the space to act a little bit as its own room, but just to want to make sure it's ready for an extension of the landscape on the round side. And to that end, like, all the materials that are being used in this area are materials that are being used in this area. Here, as a reminder, is the uh, floor plan of the uh, proposal that we brought you to today, showing the central plan, um, the central planter, and uh, a reinterpretation of the um, paving that is on the front of it. And you can see that what we've done is we've taken the pink one from the two thousand and and we've used it. We've also um, ganged some of the larger squares together and you know, related them to the uh, side of the building, centering the gang of three on the windows and emphasizing the new entrance with a single piece at the far end, which also relates directly to the bench, which has been relocated from what is now the threshold to the western wall. Um, again, a more detailed view of the previous proposal and our updated proposal. Um, again, you can see the um, motif, the square bluestone motif um, with papers that made in the pinwheel has been reused. Um, we have introduced a different surface finish, um, some of the granite papers. Um, the main field of the papers is a bit of a flame finish just for um, to create this border without introducing another material, it's going to be a sound plastic finish, so that differentiation will be very subtle, but we think it also helps to create two distinct jumps with the kind of like that space. And again, all the materials and materials are being used as well. You can also see the benches along the southern counter um, that have remained, that have been disengaged from the counter wall. Um, here we can see a section through the plaza um, showing the central planter being moved. You can also see the light poles, which are going to be located between the trees uh, on the southern planter, um, southern planter and integrated with the trees so that they are uh, less visible. Um, because the planter was uh, removed, it had previously been the location for a Description dedicated to positive commercial clothes. Um, we have chosen to start a description in the field at the threshold of the end of the positive. Um, and then we've just given a lot of descriptions that exist on the other side of the terrace. Um, and the um, inscription for Stephen H. Fortune is um, maintained by the entrance, which is important to. Sorry, 
be drifting away from the microphone. The um, inscription um, for Stephen A. Schwartz, and it's important to note that um, it, it is, you know, exists on this side of the place where it is not visible from the location of any of the other inscriptions of the building, and vice versa. And therefore, there is uh, no cumulative effect of, um, of the placement of the inscription on the building that is seen here in isolation. To move one step further along, we're going to come to the loading dock area where we want to make improvements to um, enable the secondary loading dock to function better and widen the archway so that vehicles can get in and out of the loading dock into the interior of the building without scraping and denting the fabric. Um, the question that was raised here was about um, the lighting in the sun. Uh, <coughs> On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the overall lighting panel for the site. Red dots are historic fixtures. Uh, blue dots are light blue dots are non-original lighting elements, and the darker blue dots are the lighting poles that we propose as part of our application. Um, they will use the same uh, fixtures and design as the poles that were approved on the Fifth Avenue side of the building. Um, and we are also removing, as part of this, surface mounts of fixtures and conduits that are visible from the public way in the loading dock area. Um, just as we did in the 40s Street Terrace side, we, we do not want to fix things onto the facade of the building if we can avoid it. Um, so, in our previous proposal, we had four poles at the loading dock. Um, in the terrace, we used undermensch lighting. Um, and a pole in the planter as well as supplementary lighting at the end of the $50. Um, there's also some light integrated into the piers at the threshold to the plaza. And um, fifth and the terrace side, we have, as I already mentioned previously, located two poles in the southern planter. Um, we have updated this to reduce the number of pole lights in the loading dock to just two, and we were able to do this by uh, recessing some lights in the canopy over the secondary loading dock to make sure that the library has adequate coverage um, in that area. Um, we have removed the underbench lighting from the 40th Street Terrace, um, and lighting of this zone is now provided by poles three of which um, are located interspersed between the trees um, in the set planter so they are obscured. And similarly, we have the two discreetly located poles flanking the steps of the fifth plaza to light this zone um, on the uh, fifth avenue terrace. Um, to wrap up, when we take a look at the 40th Street facade, you'll see the existing at the top of the screen. On the bottom of the screen is the design from our proposal that was presented two weeks ago, and this is the updated elevation for the changes that we've made. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Okay, so um, we can have a motion to close the proceedings. And I do want to just note for the record that we did receive uh, written comments from Committee to Save the New York Public Library. Had all part of, has already been uh, distributed to all of you and um, is part of the record. So I think we can start our discussion that, you know, at the last public hearing, the um, final comments in the end were to ask, we asked the applicants to restudy the design of the planter and to eliminate one light fixture at the loading bay. And I think the applicants took those comments very seriously and didn't just sort of address them discreetly as we had um, asked them to, but really thought about it comprehensively and I think thought about the design and that um, allowed them to really think about the paving some more and how the paving relates to the historic paving on the Fifth Avenue Plaza. And so I think we've seen a series of changes here that um, flowed from our, our comments about those two discrete elements. So I think it's been a, a comprehensive response uh, to our comments. Would you like to start, Michael? I agree. I think they're very thoughtful revisions. Thank you. 
Any other thoughts? Okay. And you know, we did ask the applicants to address the signage again, even though it was not a comment at our last hearing or, or a direction at our last hearing. And I think that's because uh, we, since the hearing, it was raised that um, there was some discussion about the cumulative effect of signage at the 2008 public hearing. And I think I just want to state that in 2008, the commission found that the number of inscriptions on Fifth Avenue, on the Fifth Avenue entrance and the 42nd Street entrance did not have a cumulative effect. And I think that the inscription at this new entrance which didn't exist in 2008 is consistent with those findings. And again, because it's not seen in conjunction with others, it also has no cumulative effect, and it's quite modest on this monumentally scaled facade. So um, with that, I just will make a motion to close. The board of Marty's House proceedings to make a motion to approve. Yes. Yes. In the matter of docket, Fifth Avenue, New York Public Library, Individual and Interior Landmark. <clears throat> and those are to our library building designed by Carrera and Hastings and built in 1898 to 1911. The application is to modify entrances and window openings, modify the building dot perimeter wall, demolish the town, the penthouse, relocate architectural features, construct a new plaza, and install light fixtures and inscriptions. I recommend that a positive report be issued on the day. That the West 40th Street facade was designed without a central pediment as a secondary utilitarian facade featuring loading docks and mechanical additions, and therefore the proposed alterations at the base of the building will not result in the modification or loss of any significant architectural features of the building. That the proposed plaza extension Regrading of portions of the entry plaza and new door opening will allow for barrier-free access into the building from 40th Street. That the plan of the Fifth Avenue Plaza has changed over time and therefore the proposed extension of the plaza along 40th Street will not alter or disrupt any intact symmetrical plan. <clears throat> That the proposed materials and details of the plaza extension featuring planting beds, granite, bluestone papers, and recessed lighting will be simply designed and consistent with features found throughout the Fifth Avenue Plaza in terms of design materials and finishes. That the extended plaza will be located at the utilitarian southern end of the building, partially concealed by the existing historic perimeter wall, and therefore will not obscure or detract from the more significant architectural features of the building, including the primary facade on Fifth Avenue or the more prominent secondary entrance on West 42nd Street. That the removal of portions of the mechanical addition and modification of the two window openings at the West 40th Street facade for the construction of a new pedestrian entrance off the, second, off the extended plaza will not cause the elimination of any significant historic fabric. That the existing historic granite bench, piers, and frieze at the western edge of the existing plaza will be retained and retrofitted to the new setback location, thereby maintaining these significant features. That the design of the bronze pair doors at the new entrance will recall the details and finish of the historic bronze doors found at the building. That the building has an institutional tradition of engraved lettering on the masonry facade and interior surfaces, and the proposed engravings on a stone panel adjacent to the new entry will be in keeping with this practice. That the small scale of the engraving will have a discrete presence on this otherwise highly ornate facade and will not be seen within the context of the other commission approved engravings at, at the Fifth Avenue or 42nd Street facades that the engravings will be located at plain marble cladding on the building or at new plaza pavers and therefore will not eliminate any significant architectural features of the building. That widening the historic carriage entrance, currently a vehicular entrance, will involve the removal of only a limited quantity of plain masonry and the existing rusticated stones will be salvaged and relocated 
in order to maintain historic fabric at this location. That the expanded opening will align with the window bays above and will not detract from the overall symmetry of this facade. That the new marble cladding to be installed at newly exposed portions of the facade at the extended plaza and at the expanded vehicular entrance will match the adjacent historic marble units in terms of material, size, color, texture, details, and profile. That removing the stone infill between the historic piers at the loading bay wall along West 40th Street will allow for direct vehicular access from the street to both loading bays. That the neutral gray finish of the proposed gate will harmonize with the existing west entrance gate, allowing it to remain a discreet presence on this utilitarian portion of the West 40th Street elevation. That the slender tapered profile of the proposed light poles within the new and existing plazas will be seen in context of existing tall trees, historic lampposts, and other commission approved light poles, and will not detract them from the monumentally, monumentally scaled building and outdoor spaces. That the bronze finish of the light poles will harmonize with the existing material palette of the building and features throughout the plaza and that the work will not detract from or overwhelm the significant architectural and historic character of this individual landmark. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Z, uh, second and last call of the meeting item is number two, LPC 19-36173 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in Brooklyn, block 1075, lot 62, 535 First Street, in the Park Slope Historic District. A British Regency style row house designed by Fred W. Eisenland, built in 1915. The application is to construct a new competition. Uh, please note this was uh, last presented at the public hearing uh, September 18, 2018. Uh, and at that time, it was part of a larger proposal, a portion of which was approved. Uh, the portion of today, no action was taken on that. Commission of Second Park Preservation Staff. This item is 535 First Street, located on the north side of First Street between 8th Avenue and Prospect Park West in the Park School Historic District. This proposal was initially presented at the public hearing on September 18, 2018. At that time, the proposal was to install planters at the First Street area construct a rooftop addition which would not be visible from a public realm. Extend chimneys which were visible from the east and west on First Street. Construct a rear yard addition on top of the existing rear L, which would also not be visible from a public realm here. Modify masonry openings at the L and excavate at the rear yard. At the public hearing, the commission has approved the planters rooftop addition at the rear L, modifying masonry openings at the L, and excavating at the rear yard. However, the commission took no action in regard to the rooftop addition and the chimney extensions. Some commissioners had expressed concerns regarding the rooftop addition in terms of its presence on the block without other rooftop additions. And the visibility of the chimney extensions over the front facade. The applicants have addressed these comments by reducing the size of the brick competition, by setting it back further from the front facade, and lowering the height of the addition to 11 feet and 2 and 3 8 inches, which eliminates the need for visible chimney extensions at the southern end of the roof, and therefore the addition and its chimneys will not be visible from public areas. <coughs> the newly proposed rooftop addition is stucco and metal clad with metal window and door assemblies. In the sections, you can see the mapping of the new proposal compared to the previous proposal. And here are rooftop plans showing the previous proposal and the current proposal. To help you visualize the change in proposed massing, here are renderings of the existing roofscape looking northwest. Previously proposed roofscape and currently proposed roofscape. And here we have renderings of the existing roofscape looking southwest. The previously proposed addition can be seen here. And here is the current proposal. Here we have images of the visibility of the mock-up at the roof looking northeast on First Street. 
Here we have images of the visibility looking northwest on First Street. And here are images of the mock-up at the roof. The newly proposed rooftop addition and chimney, chimneys will not be visible from public thoroughfares. The applicants are here to answer any questions. Are there any? The site plan that shows the, the, uh, the whole block. Yes. <coughs> Okay. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay. So um, I just want to note for the record that we did um, receive, since the public hearings is, uh, and related to this current revised proposal, 15 letters in opposition and um, a letter from friends supporting. Um, the alterations to the openings and facade materials at the penthouse, um, but all the opposition to the rear facade, which has already been approved by the commission, which is looking at the penthouse. Okay, so I think, um, you know, the last time this had um, an unusual shape because of the stair hall and because of its size and form, it also resulted in the chimney seating to be increased and the chimneys were visible and so I think the commission felt both in terms of visibility but also its shape and size on the building that it was not appropriate or some did anyway. So I think they've simplified it. It's much more typical in form of other rooftop additions. It is a block where there are, are no other rooftop additions but um, you know, the commission has found this type of addition to be appropriate, especially when not visible from any public way. So, any other thoughts? Well, and so, I mean, we don't have a precedent for not approving additions on blocks that don't have them, but I know. <laughs> we have I've done it many times, but I know that it's a concern of yours, especially when the block is over standing. I, I agree with that opinion. This is what, what's not shown here is that this is, a, this is one of several that are designed the same as possibly the most elegant row of, of fronts. In my opinion, in all of Park Slope, it, it's like the crescent of Bath, and I, I agree that, that anything that, that is an encroachment upon that it has to be looked at very carefully, and I agree with my colleagues. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, seven, I, yes, John. Okay, so, and I'm just wondering i know that it's a it's a particular row and everybody feels important it's important to maintain it but because it's not visible from a public way maybe could you talk a little bit more about sure i i you know, I, I recognize that this is an outline opinion and i'm happy to say that uh, but my view has been has been that if a block is pristine in one way or another it merits a more strict uh, opinion about protecting its integrity as an intact block, whether it's here or in Ridgewood or, or in, uh, anywhere else. Um, so for me, although I know the road it is an actually stunning row of townhouses, for me what, what's the most telling is the site plan, and it, it shows a varied uh, uh, courtyard scape of additions at the ground level but it shows an incredibly uniform scape. And so from that vantage point alone, I would say that there is a little precedent on the block for uh, rooftop addition. Therefore, such a rooftop addition would be compatible with the development of the rest of the block. Okay. Gene? I, I appreciate what your uh, Say, Michael, I, I lived on this block for about 10 years, and um, it's a beautiful block, and I was extremely concerned uh, with the first iteration. But I, I feel like, given the fact that it's it can be seen, there's, uh, you know, we need to give, um, 
property owners some flexibility. And if they, I actually feel that they've been very responsive and responsible in what they've come back with. So I feel as though I can support this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's good arguments on both sides of this, though. Um, but I think I'm favoring what, what uh, Jeannie has just said for the reasons that she said. The lack of visibility from the public, um, from the public way, I think, convinces me that this could be acceptable. Okay, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, I think that, and I do appreciate that it's a consistent grow and it hasn't yet had changes, but I also, you know, being the person who's going into new districts to try to convince people to be designated, I do think that allowing some flexibility is really important and that, you know, I think that for me, I wouldn't want to have preservation be seen or designation be seen as preventing any change. And so I know there's opportunities at the rear here, but I also feel that a very, you know, very modest small box on the roof is consistent with approvals that we've done elsewhere where there is no view of it from a public way. The public's perception of this building is that it remains intact. So I'm on this side, yes. All right, I'll tell you one other issue, which I think I've been relatively consistent with, and that is the use of roofs. I think our whole city should be using its roofscape um, in a much more robust way. I realize that uh, what Commissioner um, has suggested does not prohibit that. So, uh, you know, get, getting up to the roof uh, would still be possible with your uh, bulkhead, but I think having a, a little room up there that makes it all uh, more usable and um, for the reasons that you said about being able to change very carefully and appropriately uh, buildings in historic districts is important to me too. The only thing I'll throw in there as a so last comment from my end is, is I think that um, we very much, and for good reason, hew to the uh, standard of visibility as a very important standard. But I think it's not necessarily the only standard by which we should be evaluating appropriateness. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the standards that we do use occasionally, but maybe not uh, with as much priority as, as, as visibility, is a kind of understanding of the, of the building block as an abstract object, as a thing. Um, and um, I think in this opinion, I, over the relatively short time that I've been here, it, it has been something that's kind of waxed and waned, and it's, it, it, it's a focus at the table here. Um, but I think it's I think it's something to think about, and maybe not in this case, but in others, that, that there are other standards besides visibility that should guide our Absolutely. preservation effort. I, I agree, and I do think, that's why I think that this, I think we look at visibility as well as scale and massing and form and how it relates to the building. And so I think that the, form originally was very um, at odds with the building and so I think that you know my feelings about it have a lot to do with it's being reduced in size to a simple box. Uh, Kim and Adi, can we maybe have, I know we probably don't have enough for a vote today but it would be good to just hear from you as well. Uh, I agree with Fred and uh, with Jeannie that yes um, it's a pristine road but um, you cannot see the addition. It's a world scale addition. It's, it's, it's fitting in. And um, I think it's uh, acceptable. Okay. It's not over, it's not large. It's, it's, it's to scale. So I think it should work. Okay. <laughs> if I can just jump in for one second to try to help. To clarify some issues. Uh, you know, um, to your point, uh, Michael, the commission is not just visibility. The commission has looked at cumulative impacts um, uh, you know, in this specific context for quite some time. You know, whether the total changes in the rear and the top of the building somehow change fundamentally what this building is. And so um, I, I'm leery of, of 
the commission looking at this and saying just because there is no other, there are no other rooftop additions on this block, therefore it's inappropriate. We, we don't take that view on just about anything. That just because it's the first, and especially if it's not visible, I think that's it's a standard. I think we should be very wary of adopting. So perhaps I think it's best to think go back to the sort of touchstone of cumulative impacts to think about what are the changes here that may that that may uh, take this application over the line and. and and so, so I wonder whether it's worthwhile for us to revisit briefly, if we have time, Sarah, what was approved in the rear so that we have a sense of the scale of that change and maybe get a link sort of thoughts about the, the, the appropriateness of this addition to perhaps what was or was approved in the past. I think that's, that's historically sort of what we've done, sort of look at the cumulative impact. And, and so I offer that as a suggestion. Maybe it's, maybe it's not, uh, we don't have enough today, maybe anyway, but um, thought. Uh, yes. I, I, I understand what Mark is saying. I, I seem to recall several incidents where we did, in fact, prevent um, new additions on roofs where there where none existed. The, the, again, I, I continually go back to that statement about what is happening here and how it improves the district. And to me, there is nothing about this that actually improves the district. Okay, so I think um, you know, we have the variation up. It seems like it was mostly about uh, the devastation changes. Last time there was an existing variation. Um, but I think we're, we don't have enough uh, people to vote today one way or another. So I think what we'll do is we'll ask you to come back and maybe you can also think about some of the comments that you've heard and think about it. Yeah. Well, the rear yeah. 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 It's rear and it's already been approved. So uh, we'll, we'll have you back when we have a larger group of commissioners. Okay, commissioners, we're going to move to public hearing items. The first item number one, LPC 19 29675, an application for a certificate of appropriateness of Borough Brooklyn, Block 276, Lot 12, 181 Atlantic Avenue in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. A one story brick building, a uh, brick store building. The application is to demolish the building and construct a new building. Commissioner Bowman. And then this is the proposed uh, primary and rear elevations. 
uh, which will be shown further in detail on the slides that follow. The primary facade will feature a four-day fenestration pattern, cornice, stairwell head, and ground floor storefront infill, while the rear facade will feature a more simple configuration with partial width balconies as a setback second and fourth floor. So the visible west side elevation will feature a stucco cladding system finished in a neutral color, uh, which is similar to existing secondary visible facades on the street. The mostly non-visible rooftop bulkhead uh, will only be minimally visible from very oblique angles along Atlantic Avenue and uh, will be on brick to match the primary. Here are the existing and proposed streetscapes and some angle views of the proposed condition. The proposed materials palette, including red brick, cast stone, lintels and sills, and metal cornice, takes its views from other buildings found along the streetscape and throughout the historic district. And here's a full view um, within the context of the adjacent building. The storefront, uh, the proposed infill will be composed of a metal window and entrance door assemblies and wood, piers, bulkheads, sign bands, and cornice. <coughs> and the architect has provided some further uh, details of that storefront condition. And then here are the proposed lintel and sill and cornice profiles. The proposal is to finish the lintels and sills uh, with this beige color, and the storefront infill as well as the main cornice with a dark gray. And the architects are here to answer any questions. Would you like to add anything to what's been presented? Or are there any questions for the architects? Okay, we'll take part of the testimony and we'll come back to it. Um, Judy Stanton. Judy Stanton for the Brooklyn Heights Association. We do not oppose the demolition and consider the new building as proposed to be appropriate. We believe that the grounds to allow demolition should be stringent and determined by reference to the circumstances of a particular building. In this case, we note that the building's facade appears to have been substantially altered prior to the designation of Brooklyn Heights in 1965. Before that, the 1940 tax photo showed that the storefront comprised of richly detailed corners and other elements. Our own research indicates the building dates to the 1870s, if not earlier. However, barring the discovery of evidence of the storefront's earlier iteration existing under the mid-20th century alteration, we believe the building at the time of designation reflected none of that history and made no contribution to the district. We feel that that is equally true today. Therefore, we do not oppose its demolition. Overall, we believe the design for the new building is acceptable as contextual infill and is appropriate. But the treatment of the storefront and its materials and layout could be refined by more firmly choosing one direction or another. One approach would be to reflect more cues from the 1940 tax photo, such as the storefront's heavy cornice and the rhythm of the facade openings. Another possible direction would be to take a more consistently contemporary approach. Last, we are pleased to hear that the grocery store will resume operations in the new way. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from Community Board 2 recommending approval. Uh, are there any final questions before we close the hearing? Okay, so uh, motion to close the hearing. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. So I mean, I think that this building, um, in terms of its height, street wall height, scale, and massing, fits in with the streetscape and even materiality, um, including the brick and you know, the cast stone. Um, I do think that there are some details that could be refined. I think that 
um, you know, the lentils, I think, could be refined with the staff. I did just get some comments about the storefronts. We've heard some testimony about the materiality of the storefronts, the combination of wood and metal. You know, the, the idea of a solid sign band as opposed to a kind of cornice sign band, which would allow the storefront windows to come up higher. So if, does anyone have thoughts on those particular details? Not exactly. Um, I think once you accept that demolition uh, is possible, and I think to the extent of a very compelling case, in this case, demolition is acceptable, um, um, and then it's hard to oppose, of course, the, this building, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it could have been a very contemporary building, and I approve that too. Uh, but it's, it's the choice of the owner to, to um, interpret the style, obviously, uh, the of the building. I think they've done a reasonably good job, I think, working with staff. They can get some of those details a little more accurate. The one thing that the rendering shows, which I, my eye catches, and I don't know if this is just rendering detail, digital techniques, or actual uh, ideas here about the size of the brick, but it's, it's, uh, it's way too big. And uh, if it's meant to be jumbo bread or anything like that, that would be inappropriate. And we should be looking to the size of the bread for the one that's not the size of the bread, which relates to the company that's I agree with those, and I agree with the statement about the bread, too. I think it's a rendering issue, and I just trust that the staff is, is accepting it what has been chosen, we haven't seen any samples. Any other thoughts? Um, just in reference to your point, um, when I look at some of the examples on page 25, uh, sorry, you were pointing about the sign band mm -hmm. and uh, whether or not the windows should go up. There is an example of, of one of the, that and one in the middle, it's a glucose. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, and I'm wondering if, if we should encourage them to go in that direction, where it's, where it's sign over the glazing, maybe? Right. Yeah. Rather than within the opening. Exactly. Above the opening. Um, yeah. working with staff, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But just so I understand, does that mean that they don't get a grid of No, they can still have an awning. It's really that one thing if you historically store constitutionally fit within their opening and signs would be above the opening or integrating into the cornice. And what they've done here is they've brought the sign into the storefront infill within the opening. And so it reduces the amount of transparency. And I think it's you know, not a major issue, but it's something that would improve the proportion of the integrated above the opening. All right. and, I, and I think that goes for all of the details, the storefront details and the window details. Because it is such a contextual building, I think the details will be very important. So we'll want to make sure we continue to work with the staff on those details. And the crisis is And just, and, and thank you for mentioning the the demolition of the existing building. I just want to make sure everybody is okay with the demolition of the building. Okay, I want to say one other thing. This is um, this particular <coughs> use is an incredibly important use in the street. So, uh, I mean, I uh, when I lived in Brooklyn, I went here, and uh, I live in Manhattan at the moment, and I still go to the store. So, uh, thank you for. Uh, being actually a wonderful uh, provider of incredible produce <laughs> and for uh, developing uh, your property in a thoughtful way. Okay, great. So, Fred, we skipped you, John. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, on the matter of 181 Atlantic Avenue, the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, this is an application to demolish the building and construct a new building. Uh, I note that the existing one-story brick building uh, was originally constructed in the 19th to early 20th century 
uh, experienced several alterations prior to designation, including the replacement of its entire facade, and that the storefront was further altered in the 1990s. So, uh, I further note that the Brooklyn Heights Historic District is characterized uh, as a residential area, primarily consisting of 19th uh, century brick and brownstone houses. Um, and I finally note that within the district, the Atlantic Avenue streetscape features one to four story residential uh, buildings with ground floor storefronts, all originally constructed in the mid 19th century, pri primarily featuring brick facades of varying colors, punched masonry openings, and projecting cornices. And I recommend approval, noting that the existing one story commercial building is not one for which the historic district was designated, and therefore its demolition will not detract from the special historic and architectural character of the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. That the massing height and composition of the proposed four-story building will match two adjacent buildings and will relate to the Atlantic Avenue streetscape, which features a variety of building heights above ground floor storefronts, the majority of which are four stories. That the, uh, the aspects of the proposed uh, materials palette, including red brick, uh, cast stone, dark gray metal windows and cornice, and dark gray wood storefront infill, will harmonize with the masonry materials and finishes uh, of buildings found throughout this historic district and along Atlantic Avenue. <laughs> that the fenestration pattern at the Atlantic Avenue facade featuring double hung windows uh, with profiled cast stone lintels and sills will recall the facade composition of neighboring buildings. That the composition of ground floor components including piers, display windows, bulkheads, entrance doors, a sign band, and an awning will uh, be compatible with commercial character uh, with the commercial character of the bases of buildings throughout the historic district. At the rooftop bulkhead, while minimally visible uh, from select vantage points, will be simple in design and, um, and, and silhouette, clad with brick to match the primary facade and comparable to rooftop accretions found on other buildings along Atlantic Avenue. That the visible west side facade will feature a stucco cladding system with a neutral finish, consistent with secondary facades found at neighboring properties. That while the first floor of the building will extend to the uh, rear lot line, it will not overwhelm adjacent properties or detract from the character of the inner block, which features a variety of buildings with deep extensions. Uh, that the plane of the upper stories at the rear facade will be at a depth that is consistent with other buildings uh, in the row. That the rear facade, which may be only minimally visible from a very limited viewpoint along State Street, will feature a simply designed fenestration pattern, partial width balconies, and a color palette that is in keeping with typical rear facades of buildings within the historic district and that the proposed new building will enhance the special architectural character of the Brooklyn Heights historic district, um, and that certain details, uh, I note also that certain details of the storefront infill and surround, including the proportions of the cornice, sign band, and transoms are, are not consistent with storefronts typically found in the district. Uh, therefore, I propose that the proportions and design details of the storefront and fill and surround be adjusted and refined in consultation with the commission staff. So, yeah. the size of the brick. Yeah, just to include the details of the cornice of the and, and the size of the brick, specifically. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, we're going to uh, jump just one item to item number three, LPC 19-35463, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, Block 25539. This is 200 Monody Street, Borough Wall, Skyscraper, Historic District. An altered modern style new building designed by Philip Burnbaum, and built in 1950 60, with two stories added, 1967 to 68, and 
criminal facade they added in 2006. The application is to demolish this building and start the new building. Elizabeth Bacon, Preservation Staff. This item is 200 Montague Street, located on the south side of the street between Court and Clinton Streets in the Borough Hall Square Street the Historic District. The proposal before you today is to demolish an existing four-story building and to construct a new building. The applicants are here to walk you through the proposal and to answer any questions. Richard Benson from Meyer Blizzard, Valve Marketplace. Um, let, me, let me just start off with the sort of. If you want to walk around, just hold the mic with you. Okay, We've well, been I'll having hold difficulties here. with the overhead. Right. Right. We'll That's Richard Benson from Meyer Blizzard. Let me just start off with the uh, profile in the Federal Hall's Skyscraper Story District designation report. I just want to point out a few things. The first building on the site was built in 1959-1960 by Philip Burbank. It was a two-story building. In 1968, he enlarged the building with two additional floors on top of it, so it became four stories. In, late, in 2006, the, build, the curtain wall uh, uh, failed. Uh, it came off the building, uh, uh, was demolished. And a new curtain wall or a cow wall, a unitized cow wall, uh, uh, clear glass or operable window system was installed. Uh, uh, for those who don't know Philip Herb now, uh, he was an incredibly prolific architect, born in New York City, 1907, he died in 1996, he was 89 years old, uh, uh, went to school at Columbia, produced and reported 300 buildings. And it's sort of incredible. The majority of that were residential buildings at the time. Uh, and um, uh, uh, he became the architect of uh, this and, and, and the addition. But I just want to point out a couple of, of things. One is the materi materials. It, it says metal, glass, and granite. In fact, the building that's there today from 2006 is a unitized cow wall, uh, curtain wall system. Um, and uh, I just don't want to make any mistake because metal and glass, I think, more or less refers to the building that was there. Same thing's true of the significant architectural features. It says glass and metal curtain wall, uh, framed by Grant Pierce. So it's not only glass and metal, it's also uh, cowl. In fact, everything from the second floor up, 60% of that wall is now cowl. Um, the uh, first scheme uh, 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 was published in 19. 59, there was a rendering of it. It was a drive-through bank. Uh, the way it worked, it was a one-story building, drive-through, uh, with a turntable in the back of the site that turned the cars around and come out. And come out. Uh, suburban touch uh, 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 to a bank in, in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, so I guess that, that scheme really didn't work with the turntable. And in 1961, there was another rendering that came out of the two-story building. And in this case, at the same time, Burnham was also designed at 175 Bremson Street, which is just to the south of this. Um, Bremson Street would have a 30-foot easement through the building on the ground floor. So cars would come in through um, the Bremson Street and exit out on, on Montague in order to make the drive work. Uh, just a couple of photos of, uh, from 1979 looking at the uh, 1968 uh, uh, four-story building. And I just want to go through a little bit of the sequence of changes that occurred in this building, starting with the initial two-story design uh, by Burbank. It was a, uh, uh, a curtain wall system. Uh, it had black spandrels, uh, clear glass. Uh, the, framing of, of, uh, the framing of the uh, uh, the volumes was about six, seven and a half feet each. It started the ground floor and went all the way through the second floor. You can see the, right here, the drive the drive through lane. It also had a light well that went down to the basement level. The idea was that you could look into their vault area. The fact is, it was never actually built and 
all that visible down there. There's a stairs that went down to the wall that's actually underneath where the black room is today. Uh, it had a canopy over the entry with three black granite uh, uh, storefronts uh, to the right. There's a stair and an elevator that the back of that in that corner. And then the signage for Latvia National Bank was well it. Well, uh, in 1968, Bill Hoover's author, it was a large four stories, it still had the drive through There was another sort of sign that was put up now, it became Republic National Bank, to do with an eyebrow. Uh, the entry, the black red uh, um, storefront still remained, the white mail is still there, and it still has the frame, it just enlarged the frame. So I think the building had this sort of abstract curtain uh, uh, wall composition to it, and it was framed by the, uh, the black granite uh, uh, piers. In um, 1990 the drive through came out. So the last four storefronts, these last, and be, uh, uh, converted from a drive through to storefronts. Um, a new canopy appeared in the center of the building, right there. The light bulb uh, still remains. So um, the, the changes occurring in 1960 were basically the, uh, the elimination of the, of the drive-through and also the elimination of the uh, signage that appeared on the, on the second floor there. In, in 2005, the curtain wall uh, uh, failed. Um, there was massive amounts of uh, air and water infiltration into the building. Um, the bank owner, HSPC, hired Facade and D to take a look at a series of options uh, from least expensive to more expensive. In fact, the system that was chosen was this sort of unitized, curtain, uh, unitized cow wall um, uh, and clear glass um, curtain wall system. And that then was installed from the second floor up to uh, the fourth floor. The, uh, uh, the volumes that used to go all the way through the building were then cut at the ground floor. There was this large um, band, metal band, that went across it for the transition. Uh, the two storefronts to, to the uh, left were altered again, uh, the three door and also uh, louvers. Uh, the canopy was altered here. Uh, the canopy was designed as the entry and a series of uh, ramp came in in order to get into uh, this entry of the building. So it was a uh, rather severe and uh, significant change uh, to the building itself and uh, with uh, brand new lighting. I just also wanted to point out that when you take a look at the existing, the 1968 version, it was about 60% clear glass and about 40% of sandals. Actually, the reverse happened on this scheme, where 40% became clear glass, 60% became the uh, spandrel material. So uh, I think a, uh, an incredible <coughs> change uh, 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 to the build and a severe alteration, and I don't think there's really any uh, uh, association you can make with this building from 2006 with the original building uh, from 1968. Just some photos of some of the details around the buildings. On the upper left, on the upper left is the ramp goes into the entry that was built in 2006. On the upper right is also the ramp uh, that was built. Uh, the lower photograph shows the uh, light well that existed uh, originally in the building, with the building, and in the detail looking down you can see that light well off of the bottom. A couple of details of the cow wall system. It's uh, basically opaque. Um, system, you can see some of the details. Each of the, there were, was a modular system. They were installed as these sort of unitized panels. They came with the cow wall. They came with the clear glass up above. It was a quick uh, uh, and inexpensive uh, installation into, into the building. You can see how some of the jointing occurred uh, uh, as these panels went up, the gas gate in between. Uh, not quite as elegant as the original uh, curtain wall that was on the building. Uh, so the Burhall Skyscraper Historic District is an ensemble of 21 buildings. Uh, originally sort of the heart of uh, downtown Brooklyn's office district with uh, very notable examples of skyscrapers uh, in, a, uh, in an area and uh, for a district that has gone through significant change over the years. 
So I just wanted to point out, we're looking uh, uh, west, northwest. Um, in the foreground uh, is Columbus Park, Court Street, Barrow Hall. You sort of point out the three very sort of, I think, uh, character-defining buildings that make up the district. One is 16 Court on the corner of Montague, 26 Court, 32, and 75 Livingston. Those are the tallest buildings. In fact, 16, 26, and 75 Livingston were all built within three years of each other in the 1920s. Our building is off Montague Street, adjacent 16 Court, which is right here. The building next to us is 188 Montague and then 186 Montague. Both those buildings are in the district. This is a view looking um, uh, 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 east, uh, uh, actually looking towards the sort of 21st century uh, office district of Brooklyn. But you can still see it still has that pretty nice and beautiful sort of silhouette uh, uh, along uh, uh, Columbus Park. And I also just want to note that the buildings on the side streets are more or less street wall buildings, approximately 12 to 14 floors each. So it's a really tight uh, uh, ensemble and uh, I think uh, pretty, pretty beautiful in its sort of skyscraper silhouette. So we did a timeline of uh, the district itself and its 21 buildings, starting with the first building that went up, which was um, the Borough Hall, and that was 1845. And then we took the timetable right to the building that exists today uh, that was altered in 2006. It's a 160 year timetable. You can probably see that the sort of height of construction within the district, within the district itself was in a 30 year period between 1900 and 1930. 14 buildings were built during that period of time, so two thirds of the district were about 67 percent of the district was built in those uh, 30 years. But what's interesting is that the time period between 1920 and 1930, there were eight buildings that were built. And that was sort of the height of the time of uh, uh, many of these skyscrapers were built. In fact, the, uh, uh, the 16 court, 26, 75 Livingston were all built within that period of time and all built within three years of each other. Then it was another 30 years until 1960 uh, when 200 Montague Street went up. Then it was another 46 years until the 2006 version. So it's basically almost 80 years from the time the, first, the last building went up in the district the time of the altered buildings that we're looking at today. So I think in many cases, um, it's really outside the, uh, uh, the time frame of what most of the construction happened in this district. Um, um, and, I, and I think there's uh, any association also with the older 1960 building that's being completely lost and completely compromised um, uh, by 2006. We did a survey of all the buildings in the district. We want to go through that in any detail. All the information came off the designation report. I just wanted to point out the last page of our survey basically looks at the buildings that were built uh, from about 1925 uh, to 1928 or so. And in this case, you know, the three largest buildings in the district, uh, 75 Livingston, 26 uh, Court, and, and 16 Court, were all built. The name of our building um, originally in 61, and that shows obviously from 2006 80. So, an 80 year gap really between the height of construction and the height of this sort of character defining buildings that you find in the district to the building that we have today. But I also found it interesting that in the 17 page essay, The Historical and Architectural Development of the Borough Hall, Skyscraper Historic District, of those 17 pages, uh, 200 Montague is uh, mentioned at the very end, uh, uh, and there's basically two lines on, on our uh, on our building. One is that we built in 1959, 1960, by the fellow program, as a new building. There's then a note uh, uh, regarding the 175 building about the easement through that building and the suburban touch it brought to downtown Brooklyn, and then a final line about the building, which was there was an addition to the building in 1967, 1968 by Philip Burbank. 
Well, that was it. That's where the sort of story ends, but it really doesn't end at that, at that time because we've got our building from 2006. So um, it really doesn't fall with, with the amount of detail and the amount of descriptive material about the district and about the character of the buildings. We have just two lines, and, but there's nothing in that report at all about the alterations that happened in 2006. So I think they are really sort of outside of that sort of uh, phases, those phases of development that gave that the, the district is, is uh, historic character. Well, our site is on uh, 200 Montes, 100 by 100, 10,000 square feet. Uh, our building is actually set back seven feet off the property line. The existing bank is set, off, set back seven feet off the property line. It matches the two buildings that are adjacent to it. We will do exactly the same thing. Uh, there is a base FAR of 10, uh, a 12 FAR we have inclusionary housing. We will have inclusionary housing. It will be bought by certificate off-site to another project in being built in Brooklyn. So uh, that will give us 120,000 square feet FAR uh, and 215 foot height uh, We have a 20 story. 20 story building, down floor would be a lobby, and there would also be retail, so the re also room in the uh, uh, first cellar for additional retail. The bank had two uh, two cellar floors. Uh, so we'll have retail on the first floor, the, uh, uh, the lowest level would be building amenities, but everything else would be residential. We set back on the 15th floor, we have a bulkhead on top of our building uh, uh, of 40 feet. Uh, the basic massing of the building from uh, Monte Street is on the left, again, uh, set back 7 feet, up to 15 foot, set back 8 feet, since you have to set back 15 feet on the narrow, the narrow street. We're already set back initially at 7 feet, you just need to set back an additional 8 feet. We'll go up to the 20th floor, and park the be on top of that, the small dormer uh, uh, on, the, on the corner of the building. In the rear, the building just sets back 30 feet, the light in there, and goes straight up to 20 feet. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, our building is squeezed in on uh, Monte Street between 16 foot, um, 188 foot, and 186 foot. Um, what's interesting is that 16 foot really anchors the district. I mean, there's two, two bookends. There, there's 75 buildings there, and there's 16 foot. But Monte Street had pretty good visibility from Columbus Park. Um, uh, uh, and, and what we're ending up with, uh, this side here, is about a gap of 100 feet, 100 feet to 188 and 186, both within the district itself. So I think the idea of sort of uh, 16 port in that corner of the district itself becoming an anchor was important to us. So, we have is basically the existing uh, street wall on the left and on the right is basically the massing that we are proposing. But the idea here was to uh, infill the gap and to have the building to step down. If you look at 16th Court, right, the building stepped back, they stepped down, there's a secondary facade and they stepped back slightly. So we would like to continue that sort of stepping gap in order to engage 188 and 106 feet and 186 Street, uh, 186 Monty into the district. We want to be able to sort of grab them, adhere to them, um, and weave them back into the district. Um, we also want to make sure that we really have a good, solid uh, continuity of street wall, one that really sort of anchors the district on that on that corner, um, and, 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 and one that uh, really engages our our neighbors. And if we look at the buildings uh, in the district, just outside the district, the borders of the district, in terms of uh, some of their characteristics, we sort of like in many of the buildings that surround us the verticality that we would find, the rhythm of the structural bays, the, the clustering of the windows, uh, the real sort of uh, exuberance of, uh, of many of the piers, the verticality, uh, and, the, and the sculptural elements that you find on, on many of these buildings. We also like the uh, totality of the building. It's a very sedate sort of district in terms of uh, uh, its own use, its use of materials and, and its color. And it goes from you know, almost the raw white to box to cream color. So uh, it's a very sort of tight sort of tonality 
which we sort of like, and they use the buildings, and they sort of, in many buildings, they sort of support a temporary feel to them. Uh, so I think we, we, you know, we want to stay within that sort of, uh, of coverage. We also like the sort of ornamental or profile appearance that you find on these buildings, and they, some of them are incredibly sort of uh, sculptural and, and, and beautiful uh, uh, in terms of the shapes that they make and the profiles that they have. And even on you know, 130 Clinton, which is just outside the district, the idea of having you know, that sort of rather flat facade, uh, um, having these sort of vertical fields, Years, which are very sculptural and uh, a whole other dimension to the building. Um, and, and, I, and I think you see this sort of thing throughout the district and the neighborhood. Uh, it, it's something that uh, we felt very strongly about for, for our building. Uh, so again, here's the existing condition on Montague Street. And here's our proposal. So again, we want a building that sort of resonates with the district and with the neighborhood, a building that really sort of echoes the corner, a building that echoes the verticality that you see within the district itself, uh, the clustering of windows, that very strong rhythmic uh, structural bay, uh, uh, one a building that uh, really steps down and steps back um, in order to weave the buildings that are adjacent to it, 188, 186, back into the district. We want something that really is a cohesive uh, and strong uh, order. Uh, materials we are proposing, starting on the, uh, the ground and working our way up, we would have a, a granite water coursing base, about 30 inches high. And then the first through the third floors would be limestone. And what was important to us was uh, the continuity of some of the bases of the buildings that surround, surround us. Back for a second. I think what was real important here was that the ground floor, the retail sort of continued through the street, right? that we've got a base height that uh, uh, matches the base height of the two adjacent buildings. Then we've got a string course, which picks up this sort of uh, uh, colonnade of uh, uh, 16. So um, really building that sort of just starts to weave and make that sort of connectivity with its neighbors. So we get limestone up to the third floor. On the fourth floor, up to the 20th floor, we're proposing GFRC, which is actually ideal material for our building because it can be shaped and molded into, com into complex forms. And we'll show you a detail of that in a minute. But it works really well in terms of having that versatility that we need in terms of its sort of uh, texture. Um, and its color. So it's a material that's extremely durable, uh, weathers well in terms of thermal cycles, um, but one that we found uh, is sort of ideal in terms of the types of shapes that we want to create with our peers. The other thing is the building faces north, so we don't have those dramatic shadows uh, you get from buildings facing directly south. So it was important to us that the piers themselves actually are a little more, have a, a more shape, more robustness, and, and, and become a little more sculptural. Um, there's metal, what we did is there's uh, aluminum, um, uh, uh, would be a charcoal gray for all the window volumes, and the transition floors on the second and third floors, and the transition floors all the way on top, right? That material, that material would also be, uh, a little bit, but it would be a uh, uh, more of a bronze color, um, so there's a little bit of contrast there. On the rear facade, uh, of, let's go to the side facade, but on the right hand side. So the uh, GFRC would continue around the side of the building to add some panels to the back side. On the back side, the material would be, there would be a frame around the building. That frame would be in GFRC, so we have a continuity all the way around the building. The panels in between would be metal, would be both a cream color, light gray, uh, and more of a charcoal color, so we get more of that sort of pretty color uh, in the rear of the building. Then a series of views. The first one is from uh, 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 the Columbus Park, uh, looking back towards our, our building, and again, the idea of the stepping of the building, and the idea of that sort of strong anchor uh, to the district on the uh, uh, on that north side. 
uh, view a little bit closer on Columbus, uh, looking towards the corner, uh, corner of Montague Street. Again, the idea of picking up and weaving together, uh, building fabric for both sides of us, the idea of strong verticality, the setback, and stepping down in the building uh, in order to engage the uh, 188 Montague. Uh, closer view, getting closer to the building on the corner of Court and Montague, again, looking at the building. The important thing to us was picking up on some of the, uh, uh, the base heights, uh, string courses, things that would tie these buildings back into the district. The importance of also picking up on the cornice at our setback level, the 188 building, and then the building coming up and setting back as, as, as it uh, engages uh, 16 court. A view looking um, uh, east uh, on Montague Street. Again, this is the 188 building right here, 188 base, and just across. This is one, uh, 16 Court Street. Again, the idea of just picking up the, the cortis line, bringing it across in terms of our setback, and then the building starting to step up at 16 Court Street. Uh, the room safe, you get a <coughs> on the back of our building. In fact, we probably only see from a couple of the photos we took in this sort of glance, the upper two floors between these two buildings on rocks, so minimally visible on rocks. Uh, this is a view uh, of 16 Court, the west elevation. And so we want to. Uh, uh, included a diagram of the windows, lock lining windows that would be closed up for our building. Uh, just a detail of the base, the first couple of floors, and again, uh, the importance to us of having really good, strong storefronts, framed storefronts with, with sign, uh, a signage band and, and dimensional lettering. Uh, the lobby entry would be to the, to the left with a canopy. Uh, water coursing on its base and the limestone going up uh, and matching the height of the, uh, the 188 building and then picking up the string course from uh, 16. Uh, just a blow up of, of a storefront. Uh, the idea is to have that sort of framing around the storefront, uh, the sign band. So I think a you know, uh, Pretty strong composition in terms of and some robustness in terms of uh, uh, each of the each of the storefronts. And then just a series of diagrams that have doors like leaving figure in the storefront in the future, depending on uh, how the tenants work out, whether it's a center door or whether it's <coughs> to uh, the upper right, uh, uh, one side, a single door, or whether a single single door goes all the way to uh, uh, closer to the pier or basically uh, a display window. So I think the storefront at least has that flexibility and those options in terms of uh, arrangement of doors and, uh, and display windows. And a blow up of the, the entry piece. The entry is set back, front door is set back about six feet. Um, we have a, a canopy, uh, uh, about five feet in depth. Uh, you would have uh, uh, a glass uh, on top of it for light to come down. Uh, the metal framing around the store for, around the the entry. Uh, so the storefront would actually continue uh, uh, to the front door on, on the sides, so feeling of you know, sort of uh, uh, depth uh, uh, to the entry, and then we build up the volumes around the entry too, so it has a sense of. Uh, uh, thickness and robustness and a uh, 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 sense of real sort of the front door. Uh, just a, uh, a blown up view of the, uh, of the entry and, and storefronts and the first few floors uh, and their connectivity and engagement with, with their neighbors. A view then looking uh, west on, east on Montague Street, again the idea of uh, the importance of the piers coming down to the ground, the frame storefronts, the consistency in the sign band, uh, and, and the uh, and the uh, In terms of some of the details, we picked out three details. One is in, I'll show you in the center, a typical bay, and then two of them of the uh, power bay. 
So this is a sort of blow up of a typical phase that happened in the building. We talked about the ability to really create something that's very sculptural and, and uh, 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 something that has this sense of robustness <coughs> and verticality. Um, so uh, uh, just to give you an idea, basically if you look at one, here's the blow up of the pier. What we liked about Hong Kong out in the district was uh, uh, that sort of sculpturalness uh, of, of those, uh, those uh, colonnades or those piers. Uh, and the sense of uh, detailing that they gave the building and the sense of verticality, which was important to us. So um, there's just a series of details in terms of both the, uh, the piers and uh, the uh, scandals, uh, both have this sort of more sort of uh, uh, sculptural feel to them. And what's nice is given, uh, 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 given that sort of sculpt uh, sculptural sort of uh, skin, Windows set back, uh, marsh back. You have about a foot of depth in the, in the building, which is terrific in terms of that really huge, uh, that's really huge shadow. Just a blow up, uh, sort of a couple of typical bays and a perspective of those bays, just showing the uh, dimensionality and, 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 and uh, 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 structural, uh, the uh, sculptural profiles of the, uh, the vertical elements. And just a couple of uh, details of the power pits. We wanted the columns to come all the way through the building, so you really get that verticality. Um, and just a detail on the left um, at the 15th floor setback, and then a, a, a detail at the very top of the building at the uh, roof power pit. But we wanted, we didn't want small corners. We wanted this, uh, the idea of this building, which is very similar to one of the other buildings in the district, to have that really sort of uh, uh, verticality that you that, that, that find. Uh, just a view of the rear facade, I just picked out a typical bed. It's essentially fairly flat, it's metal panels, um, two different colors. Um, we want to create that sort of verticality going, going through the building. So, sort of in conclusion, I think what uh, we were trying to do was to create a building that really anchors the core, uh, resonates with, uh, uh, with, with its neighbors, engages those neighbors, uh, echoes the sort of verticality that you, you find throughout the neighborhood and the rhythm of uh, structural bays and, and the clustering of, of windows uh, and, and, and one that feels you know, very complimentary <coughs> to the district and, and, and very appropriate. Thank you. Are there any questions? Actually, two questions, yes. uh, one related to one another. Uh, do you have, one is, do you have examples of uh, canopies similar to that uh, the one you're proposing in this district? And two is, uh, that you uh, know that the justification for not having a cornice is that to emphasize the verticality of the building. Uh, do you have comparable um, cornice, cornices on the um, skyscrapers in that district that, uh, uh, that have? Yeah, there's actually 185 right across the street, not a district, but an individual landmark uh, uh, building uh, by Colbert and uh, uh, Harrison, I think. Right have sort of very strong piers which go straight up, which is right across the street from us. Uh, Dralamon, 190, 185 Dralamon, Dralamon also has very vertical piers going uh, all the way up um, on their building. So I think there are examples in the neighborhood of those buildings in which there is a continuity of verticality of the pier. I don't have examples of those canopies in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go to public testimony and then we'll come back to you. Okay, John Arbuckle. Thank you. Good morning. I'm John Arbuckle, president of Doc Momo New York Tri State, a local chapter of an international organization working in over 65 countries to document and preserve building sites and neighborhoods of the modern movement. We strongly oppose this proposal to demolish 200 Montague Street, built in 1959-60 by prolific architect Philip Birnbaum for the Lafayette National Bank with a two-story addition in 1967 to 68. Despite alterations, the building still exhibits many characteristics of modern architecture. The bank had this building and the larger neighboring one on Remsen Street constructed as part of the financial district that runs along this block of Montague. Both of these buildings contribute to the sense of place and development of the commercial core of downtown Brooklyn and were included in the relatively recent landmark designation 
and should not be pushed aside simply because of their later date. We do take issue with the architectural style and designation report listed as altered modern, which is not a recognized style. We wonder whether that terminology was intended to leave the door open for future alterations to the building without consideration of its quality and contribution to the historic district. We also want to make mention of the architect, Philip Birnbaum, relatively unappreciated in his time. Birnbaum's New York Times obituary characterized him as the almost anonymous architectural hand behind many of the most imposing apartment towers in New York City. He designed more than 300 buildings, including large swaths of post-war red brick apartment buildings in Forest Hills and Rigo Park. While known for his apartment complexes, Birnbaum also designed other commercial structures, including the 1952 Metropolitan Industrial Bank on Queens Boulevard, an early showcase of industrial materials and gleaming metal. The complete demolition of a designated landmark, whether individually designated or part of the historic district, whether modern or Beaux-Arts, should only be permitted in special circumstances. The integrity of the historic district should not be sacrificed merely to satisfy an investor's desire to increase the profitability of the historic site. Please reject this proposal. Judy Stanton. <coughs> Judy Stanton for the Brooklyn Heights Association. Our Landmarks Committee has reviewed this proposal for Jewelry and Monica Street and considered its appropriateness within the Bell Pass High Street District. We do not support the application as proposed. Regarding demolition of the existing building, in our opinion, the proposal does not adequately recognize 200 Monica Street's contribution to the layered character, character of the Borough Hall Skyscraper District. And any proposal for this site must respect that contribution. Even as altered, the building is not listed as no style on the designation report. The report cites significant contributing features that include its commercial design in a predominantly commercial district and its original glass curtain wall, now well documented thanks to the applicants. The designation report also explicitly situates the current building within the overall arc of commercial development in this part of downtown Brooklyn from the late 19th century to the post-World -War, War II era a story in which the district's iconic 1920 skyscrapers comprise just one of several chapters. We are disappointed that out of a range of more sensitive approaches that could recognize the existing building's contribution, none have been taken. Those strategies could include adaptive reuse of the existing building, retention and restoration of its facade alone, or a new design that recreates or echoes the 1960s era modern style glass curtain wall which was lost. While we do not advocate a particular strategy, we feel strongly that the existing building needs to be treated as something other than disposable. Likewise, proposing residential use above the ground floor in a predominantly commercial district creates a tension that the context, the current design, needs to more fully recognize and resolve. This affects the overall impression created by the facade as a whole, which simply reads as too residential. We find this to be particularly true at the base, which is not assertive enough for the building's own facade, nor for its dialogue with those of the adjacent buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Christabel Bob. Welcome for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Uh, without criticizing now the proposed replacement, we think that the historic context of the existing building was not adequately portrayed when the designation report was negotiated. 200 Market Street should not be launched. The new evidence the 1959 Brooklyn Heights Press article from the applicant's stellar historic research is that the bank was developed by Webb and Knapp. In 1959, Webb and Knapp was a large, powerful, and architecturally progressive firm owned and run by William Zackendorf Sr., but it was overextended and slipping into bankruptcy. Starting in 1948, 
I am Peggy and Henry Call work there in house in the end leading a team of 70 architects. But prudently, they left in 1956 to set up their own firm. Stern's New York 1960 <coughs> devotes several pages to, quote, the peculiarly modern art of floating small curved spaces that Peggy, in collaboration with William Lescaz, exercised to design Seckendorf's new penthouse office. Those connoisseurs of modernism would obviously have been attuned to the breakthrough of Bunchev's 1954 Manufacturers Hanover Trust, probably an influence on an original futuristic design concept for 200 Montague. The 1959 press article notes Another feature of the glass and granite building is a vault. Two stories high in the basement and first floor, open to public view behind a window. We may speculate that Birnbaum, the reliable technician, is the architect of record because the architects of genius had by then already left the sinking ship of web and map. As a major benefactor of Long Island University, Zeckendorp had a personal interest in the revitalization promised by the Brooklyn Civic Center plan, and as a dedicated modernist developer, was ready to put his organ on Montague Street. Although the district is characterized by earlier 20th century skyscrapers, this modernist intruder speaks to us of a dramatic moment in the city's history the conflict between renewal, that's urban renewal, and preservation. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Denno. <coughs> Good morning. Jesse Denno from the Historic Districts Council. As an old style building in the Historic District, characterized by its eclectic collection of different scales, styles, and eras, HTC objects to the wholesale demolition of the still firm known as the 1960s modernist commercial building. As which as commissioners will remember, this designation was achieved not that long ago and against considerable, considerable opposition. Each building chosen to be in the district was done so quite deliberately for what it adds to the district as part of the story of the, of the area. This building speaks to the district's commercial development in the post-war urban renewal years and must be retained in some form. In an ideal world, we would like to see the building's original curtain wall restored, reestablishing its relationship to 175 Ramsey Street, which was built in Perenti by Birnbaum, with, rooftop, with a rooftop addition that related to the former bank building in the district and the proposed new building. As proposed, we find the building's design, massing, and scale would have a, have a homogenizing effect on this eclectic district. We particularly object to the use of Jit RC above the third floor, which does nothing to alleviate the monotony of this design and is likely to, be, to quickly begin to deteriorate. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay, we do have a resolution from Community Board 2 in Brooklyn recommending approval of the application. Would you like to respond to the comments? Yeah, the comments. So, you know, the 
applicant presented that the predominant construction happened sort of at the turn of the century. And, and when you read the designation report summary, it really does talk about sort of downtown Brooklyn becoming a commercial or an office district post-Civil War with, of course, this big building boom around the turn of the century and into the uh, 1920s um, with buildings that then reflected the 1916 rezoning and this ever excitement to kind of grow taller and bigger. And the summary ends with that after the Depression, the building declined, building boom declined, and it was a period of urban renewal. And it, the summary kind of ends there. So I do think that the summary of the designation report indicates that the kind of thinking behind the Borough Hall skyscraper district was about these turn of the century, early 20th century skyscraper office buildings. Having said that, you know, with time comes perspective. And, um, and so we're looking at a building that was much later than this period that's defined in the designation report. Um, and so I think that perspective is something that we all can now bring to the table. I do think um, it's worth thinking about the fact that the entire curtain wall was replaced. Um, you know, with respect to the style, the, the, um, you know, the commission has historically used no style to mean a non-contributing building. It sort of was the code word for non-contributing. And then what that does is it kind of creates this binary situation where then anything that has a style, one assumes is contributing, but a building can have a style and not necessarily be as contributing as another building with a style. So not all buildings with style are equal. And I think that what we do is we consider alterations, the purpose of, and the meaning of the designation. And so I think that's going to bring um, you know, a lot of interesting discussion to the table today. And then if we get to a um, new building, obviously I think we want to cover height, massing, um, general composition, and then of course materiality. I think, you know, it's interesting when we think of GFRC, we usually think of it as a, an alternative to a historic uh, material in the case of, um, you know, replication on a historic building. And there's this authenticity question. This is a new building, and so how does that apply on a new building? It's sort of, it's a fabric, a new material being used to look like historic fabric, not unlike cast iron in its time, uh, but I think it's, you know, it's something that I think we've been very judicious about, so I want to continue to have a conversation about that. John. Well, I, I think the original uh, Burnbound building um, was certainly um, worth uh, preserving uh, for any number of reasons, whether it was a skyscraper or not. Um, and whether it was in its first generation of two stories or its second generation of four stories, um, I, I would be the loudest, most aggressive proponent of preserving the building. However, um, when the, um, was it Fassad Zahras or Fassad <laughs> Doctor, Fassad Brunners or whatever, whatever. Um, when they, when they came along, Fassad MD, that's it, that's it. When, the, um, when Fassad MD came along, um, you know, they really um, obliterated the, all the things that um, I would have been interested um, in saving. And I would even want to save that turntable, uh, which sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, however, I mean, it's not there anymore. And um, unless we were planning to require this, um, the, the owner of the building to restore that facade. And even then, as we've heard many times, I think Mr. Bland refers to this often, uh, you know, is that really what um, the original, if you ask them to do the same thing all over again from scratch today? Um, so um, on the first issue, um, and I'll stop with that, um, we'll talk about the rest later, um, I, I am um, okay with um, taking the building down. Okay, do you want to touch on um, the new building at all, or do you want to? Okay. Uh, if you want to say that. Yes, Kim. Um, I came in when I first saw the um, presentation thinking uh, that although I love modern uh, architecture and I think the building that was originally built was very much worth preserving and should have been somewhat more of a landmark, individual landmark in itself, I 
wobbling on that a little, thinking that a lot has disappeared, a lot of that fabric has disappeared, and hoping that maybe in, that it can be demolished, and that maybe the newer building, the new building, can have some regard for that building to do something at the base at least to try to remember that building that was there and that was more modern uh, since this one goes <coughs> totally the opposite way we went from very modernist building to one that is more like an 1840 building mm -hmm. and we're going back again and I, I think there should be some way that we can if only a plaque <laughs> on the new building to remember the old building. But yes, I think the loss of the, uh, the older building is um, really a shame. But I don't see what's left to preserve. That's the problem. Um, on the new building, I'm wondering, um, I know the district is being preserved for these more masonry and punch, bowl, build, punch, bowl, punch window buildings, but um, I'm thinking it's a lot of masonry there and it just it, I don't know if it needs to be so much and if they can make it a little lighter where it doesn't have to look like it was built about a hundred years ago. Okay. Uh, so the message. Yeah. 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 The massing I think uh, is that was the last thing. I thought the massing was okay. It isn't quite as tall because it does step down. So you kind of need that setback to match the building on the way. Is that to the west? Or the building to the right? Yeah. So the massing is not so bad, but I do wonder about the mechanicals at the top, where they're not being screened or anything. It seems to be just out there. OK. Uh, so, uh, I thought that what Christabel brought up at the very end there, that, that tension that she described between um, the, the new urban renewal and preservation is this very interesting um, discussion. And, and that connects to, to my sense uh, in reference to um, Chair Gustafson's, I mean, Gustafson's points about what remains and that not much remains. So first thing I want to say that this is uh, uh, the existing building is absolutely a style building. If we think about what is happening at the same time, 1959, I mean, the, the there was reference to a bunch of uh, uh, manufacturers in Hanover but, uh, earlier, but 1958, Seagram's 58 Crown Hall, which is which speaks not only to the kind of the materiality <coughs> um, and fenestration, but to the proportion and the um, the kind of the framing of that proportion. And it's 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 so strong and continues to be present in this building by virtue of this black um, granite frame. And and the and the proportion which is interestingly reinforced even when it went from two to four. Um, and that it, it grew in the right way and, and I think further reinforced by the 100 by 100 uh, plan. But um, what what's most I think Troubling to me is is the notion that we would replace, demolish a style building, which I also think kind of um, amplifies the quality of the of the buildings that are so different from it in its context, um, and we replace it with what I think, in terms of the new proposal, is a no style building. <laughs> and th this is this gets to that tension that that uh, is describing. I think, and I think that that's really unacceptable. So I'm absolutely opposed <coughs> to the demolition of this building and to the new proposal. Okay. Michael. Um, okay. Cool. Interesting. Interesting application. Interesting conversation. I think that. Um, I guess I would, I would uh, fall on the I'm aware of the spectrum of what's been said so far, but I think there is what to say in the building. You have this volume, you have this frame, you have some of the store some of the curtain wall materials remaining on the first floor. Um, and I, I, I certainly wouldn't go out of my way to say that the uh, uh, cow wall 
modifications are worth saving. But um, I think that uh, uh, we've seen many uh, projects that have, um, let me step back. I think the most important thing that, that, that is still here is the contrast that the building has with its neighbors. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it is in an, it is in an, an, an area, that it, in a district that is a pretty diverse district that, ha that has a lot of rhythm to it, both in terms of scale and in terms of style and color. And this building, when it was built, was meant to differ from its neighbors in scale and color and administration. And I think that even with the rather lamentable uh, 2006 modifications, it remains a contrast to its neighbors. Now, I don't think that that's something that need be held on to with a firmness that is, you know, unshakable. I think that a modification to the scale, a dramatic modification to the scale in the order of what's being proposed is okay. But I think that, I, I think that there's a, a good argument to be made that the building um, should, should at least react to the district's own variety and style in a way that, that Adi suggested, where, where you know, the building is, is um, you know, this, the existing building is, is very different from its neighbors, purposefully so, and that's a, that's a mark of the history of the district. Um, and I think that that mark should not necessarily be completely erased. I don't think that means that they need to restore the building. I think that they can look at the building as an element in the district, an element in this very diverse district, and they can um, go with that diversity. I don't think it needs to be a, a, a textbook restoration per se, but I do think it, it should try to keep the spirit. And one thing that's interesting about the building in its current form is that if you look at the streetscape, it's very much at the height of the baseline, more or less, of the rest of the block. So in an odd way, its volume is, cont is contextual in the classic textbook sense that we, we see and that, that the applicant uses uh, in, in design the new building. Um, it was very it was really hard for me to kind of figure out what was bothering me about the, the new design. And then, it, as, as the applicant's very, very good presentation brought out for me, it was this. The building, in his words, seeks to step down, to transition, to infill. It's working so hard to hide. <laughs> and I think that that's not what this district's about. If you look at almost all the buildings that I could see in the flipping through of the various buildings of the district, almost all of them, corner building, mid-block building, are centered objects that are meant to be seen as individuals. They're, they have tops that are centered. They have identities that are centered. You know, all of the buildings seem to have, we say, to, to, to not look to join with their neighbors, but look to separate. Even, even you know, I mean, this, you know, clearly the building on the corner has its own central tower. It steps up symmetrically about that tower. And buildings that are infills do the same thing. They kind of set themselves apart, or they're just simple palazzo-type buildings. This is, as far as I can see, the only one that's trying to asymmetrically transition the streetscape. I think that if one took a more, a less literal approach, let's say, to that urbanistic gesture, one could achieve the scale transition that they seek to achieve without so literally modifying the volume in such a way that the building kind of looks like an addition to the building on the corner. It's not. It's an independent building. It should assert itself as such. I think that the, um, the, the base is under-articulated, interestingly. I think you know, the, the, the upper part is, I, I kind of like the GFRC as a material in the district. I think it, uh, for me, it, it's most immediate analog is, is terracotta. Uh, I would like to see a finished sample though, just to see what, what, it, what the finish would be. But I think the sculptural quality of it, I think that the profiles that they've chosen, I personally think are, are okay. Um, but I think that um, uh, the base 
is a very generic 1990s postmodern base with very flat detailing at the place where you want the more robust detailing. If you look to, if you look to either side uh, of this building, you see base articulations that are deeper than the upper floor uh, articulations. You see bases that are, are, are much more varied from their upper stories in color uh, and in texture. <clears throat> so I think that from a plasticity point of view, from a color point of view, the base has to be more uh, uh, robust. And one very good way to do it is to look at the existing building. Instead, like, you know, how do I, instead of looking at this building as an addition to the building to the east, how do I make my building an addition to the building below me? Um, and, and a, a reimagining of that. Um, that's it. Somewhere else first. Okay, Danny. Um, uh, I think I'm going to uh, build a little bit on um, what Patty and Michael said. First of all, I do want to commend the uh, applicant for the extraordinary. Historical, uh, you know, context that you presented to us in terms of the evolution of uh, this area. It's really interesting and very important, and, and I think especially important when you're considering what to do with this building. I, I do have to say that as I looked at the, uh, you know, the initial design of the building. I immediately mourned the loss <laughs> of it in its origin, and even as it evolved, uh, added two stories. It retains a lot of the the beautiful features uh, that were bound originally designed. But um, and although I I don't think that its current incarnation is, is quite as amazing. I do think it is important. And it, it, it does represent not only a, an important place in design in, of architecture in this period, but it, it actually makes a mark in the architectural and historic evolution of this street and this area from a commercial perspective. So I, my inclination and what I think is a little unfortunate is that the opportunity wasn't taken to, um, to capture that feeling. And I agree with Michael that it, it doesn't have to be a total uh, let's go back to what was originally there, but I do think it would have been extraordinary to pay homage to what was there, and also, in doing so, to define where architecture is and is going today, and to use the opportunity to really make a, a mark on this critical, Still critical on Central Street in in Brooklyn Heights. There's there's really a, you know sort of nothing wrong with what was designed, but there's nothing you know it, as as has been said, it almost like it blends in almost too well and. I think it's a lost, it really is a lost opportunity. And in order to make it work the way it is, you know, within the let's pick up on, you know, sort of what was originally here, I really do think that the building needs to be, um, again, as Michael said, it needs to be made a little more uh, robust. There needs to be more. Uh, and distinctive, and it needs to have more of a presence as the buildings around it have had. That being said, my preference would be to uh, 
work from what was there and really uh, do something that is going to respect the history and the thought behind the initial building and uh, contribute to the streetscape in a memorable, you know, well-designed way. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprising myself even about this. The, uh, uh, having, I, I lived in Brooklyn Heights for a while and I used to love walking by the Burn Mountain Building. I just thought it was a magnificent building and I was shocked and dismayed when it was turned into this sort of faux should be screen facade. Um, and I lament that to this day. I heard the, the term restore a couple of times with regard to what we could do with that building. Um, you, you cannot restore that, you can only replicate it. And that's a big jump for me. I, and I, I mean, look, John, I, I really, you know, all due respect to Bernbaum, he's, he's gone in this building as far as I'm concerned. And, and any attempt to pay homage is, is just almost ludicrous. So I, I have no uh, objection to the demolition of the building. With regard to the new building, um, again, um, I, I think I, I reflect my colleagues' remarks about a little bit of robustness. The building does seem to want to try and blend in a little bit too much. And, and so I would like to see definitely a more robust ground floor. I would like to see some more detailing on the upper part of the facade. Um, I frankly don't see anything that couldn't be worked out with the assistance of staff. And so that's where I am. Okay. Okay. So this has been a really interesting discussion and this is why we all are here and doing what we do. These are the kind of really challenging and interesting and provocative kinds of um, discussions that really you know, raise questions. So um, I think we've had a variety of comments here. I know we've had some that feel that demolition is not appropriate at all. I think many others have found that demolition could be appropriate, um, but that the design itself either for some people should sort of be in the spirit of or reflect the uh, modern design of the original building on this site. And um, others, I think, are comfortable with um, the general approach you've taken, but that really it needs to be less of a, a background or blending building and more of a statement building and, and more um, you know, I think it is true that the even the, the sort of competition at the turn of the century, all these buildings are sort of competing to be taller and to stand out the most. So maybe that's a way to think about these comments about it being more sort of individual, distinctive, and standing out on its own. Um, so that would, I think, involve a little rethinking of massing as well. So there's a lot to think about and, um, you know, from the variety of comments here. So I encourage you to work with the staff and think about it and, and we'll see you back at some point. All right, thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, move back to item number two. Uh, this is LPC 19-31160, an application for a certificate for appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 387, lot 15, 206A, Bourbon Street, in Italian South Road Hospital, uh, circa 1871 to 72. The application is to construct new top and new rear additions. At 206A Bourbon Street, an Italian aid style warehouse between Evans and Bond Streets in the Bowen Hill Historic District extensions.
So the restorative work uh, at the front facade will be reviewed at staff level. The proposed rooftop addition will not be visible in public roadway. The proposed chimney extension will be visible over the front facade. And the proposed rear yard addition will be visible from oblique angles to the brakes the street wall at Long Street and White Cross Street. The applicant is here to discuss the details of the project. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is John Hathaway, um, and I am a uh, at the architect and the writer of the art. Um, and I uh, first wanted to uh, uh, Amy covered the fact that the uh, woman from the front side of the building was approved under a uh, staff level permit and decided to be served at the staff level. So there are two primary um, components to this uh, proposal. One is a vertical addition over the existing, and another is a rear yard addition. Um, and <clears throat> this current slide shows the entire block and it's color-coded to um, indicate the height of various structures uh, on the block <coughs> and additions that have been made. Uh, what you can see is that, of course, there's a lot of uh, additions that are on the building, some of them dating back many years. And uh, in that regard, um, uh, well, I, sh I should say this is just a detail of that. Um, and again, our plot plan here shows the, uh, our intentions as far as the uh, vertical addition being set back from the uh, front facade so that it's not visible. And the uh, rear extension uh, being the full height of the existing structure, not the uh, not going all the way up to the large amount on the top. And uh, <clears throat> I'll just uh, <coughs> come back to this, but I just want to point out a, a couple of things over here. See, uh, this building on uh, Bond Street here has got a similar addition to ours in that it uh, extends over the existing building and I'll um, this is a new building uh, to replace the old tenement building. And um, the row of buildings that are sister buildings run from 206 <coughs> down to 220. And then 222 bumps out again. And it is the, that building that we extend out to the line up there. And this building, um, I'll show you photographs uh, shortly. Now, there was some concern about the existing structure on the back of the building. Um, and Amy had shown you a photograph. I'll return to that photograph in a little bit. But we did some historic research uh, using sandbar maps of um, the condition of extension of the building. And this is a floor of our block here. And you can see that many buildings did have some sort of uh, an extension here and on the other side of the block, too. Um, they aren't described in terms of height or uh, enclosure. But one of the things that's important to know, and um, I'm going to skip ahead just to the rear facade so you can um, see what's see what the photograph. Um, it's important to know that due to uh, existing uh, grade, the cellar level of this building is at the yard level. This is the basement level here. This level at the front facade here is this level right here. And then this is the sub <coughs> level, which opens up to gray. And this uh, um, extension, uh, I don't find any evidence that there is uh, remnants of any sort of existing structure here. It's on steel columns, it's framed in wood studs, and as you'll see in this photograph, framed up in two by four construction. <coughs> Um, so that's what's uh, on the back of the building presently, and uh, what I find no particular value to. Now, moving back here, um, we've got a massing diagram of what the existing structure looks like at the rear of the building. And uh, again, we've got the uh, existing four structure sticking out, otherwise, it makes it not. And there are various protrusions on these other um, houses, too similar nature. Um, 206 Bergen, or 206A, 206 Bergen Street um, had uh, some uh, rear extension 
constructed back around 2006. There's actually an approved application to add a story to this building too that hasn't been erected, but um, that application is still open um, for construction of an additional story here. And this bulkhead, um, which we'll show you photographs of later, um, have, it is at 206. Not, that's not a part of our building. That's a part of this building right here. So, um, this uh, section pretty well describes um, the situation with respect to the sight lines from Burden Street and how our addition is, um, relates to the existing building. So this is a street section here, and you can see we're set well, more obvious here, a good bit below the, uh, the sight line. And we constructed a mock-up of this, I'll show you photographs of it a little bit, um, that uh, showed that none of the uh, enlargement is visible from the street, but these uh, chimneys would uh, par partially be. They're set back and run up along the side of our extension. Um, so we achieved uh, a uh, lower building profile to avoid visibility from the street by essentially uh, removing the roof structure and lowering the floor level so that it would just look at the window <coughs> And uh, otherwise, the floor is struck with the existing floor structures inside remain. And again, this is the section which describes the fact that this solar level is level of gray at the rear. So uh, we have created a uh, montage here of um, uh, the building pieces. This is the uh, extension added to the existing mass here. And then this is the uh, rear extension. Oops, sorry. This but this in yellow here. And we carry this extension up to the line of the existing buildings here. And then um, uh, essentially we have a roof terrace on top of this thing with a glass railing that's three feet high, three foot six over the roof terrace level, um, uh, to minimize the apparent, uh, the apparent mass of the above to the line of this existing uh, cornice line, the adjacent building. Um, this is what the uh, street facade uh, <coughs> looks like, and again, we are probably really down here, and as I said, 220 to 206 Burning Street. Um, existing facade and our proposed facade, this um, addition up here not visible from the street. Um, the rear, again, uh, existing structure. Um, there was, and incidentally, there was an an application approved a few years ago for uh, reconstruction of a much larger addition to carry the other side up, but um, and the, um, some work was uh, started prematurely. A stop work order ended up uh, being imposed on this building, and when it was resolved, it was an LMM architecture. So there was a little bit of demolition work up here that was uh, done, and then this was uh, reconstructed. And uh, this is a, a wide-angle view of the various um, rear facade uh, extensions into the uh, yard. 206A has got this uh, approximately four or five foot deep by uh, seven foot wide extension running the full height, plus a build out of the parlor floor, uh, terrace of the uh, parlor floor. And there's not too much left of the existing facade there, of course. Um, there's a bigger addition down here, uh, 218, and then further down, this bigger building what is what we're extending out to, that's um, 222. Um, this is from the roof looking down into the rear yard space. This is the new building uh, on Wyckoff Street, and um, this is the, this building right here was the building that previously referred to on Bond Street that was, uh, at a floor was added and it was extended to uh, full depth, the maximum depth that they could build in order to maintain the sort of the yard. These are render ratings of the uh, front facade, street views, and uh, again showing what sort of visibility the chimneys would have. It's a bird's eye view, give you a better sense of um, what uh, the massing is like in this building. <coughs> Uh, 
extension coming up from the actual line up there, which is the part of the line flash down the boat. This is the mock up that was constructed on the roof with the uh, proposed chimney. And from the street, you can see that that chimney element is what is visible. There's a sliver view along Bond Street. There's a little gap between buildings here. A bit of the building. And then there's a larger opening along Wyckoff Street. Wyckoff Street is outside the historic district. The historic district is around the middle of the block. Um, and uh, this larger building plus this uh, well-placed tree um, obscures <laughs> the addition to Wyckoff Street. Um, this is uh, another building that, uh, um, or excuse me, a building right across the street that had a very similar enlargement built. I referred to it when we were looking at the um, log plan. Um, this extension was much taller. Um, it was built in 2016 prior to the designation of this district, and hence they were allowed to creep up over their um, cornice line. But this is a minimal wage given its much higher profile. It just sort of shows that, you know, our slower set extension would not uh, be this one. And again, this is 222 down here. This is the line for extension. Uh, then, uh, you know, we, we extend out to this line um, with our proposed addition. Um, and again, other rear yard intrusions. This is that Bond Street building that extends back. <coughs> what it looks like uh, from our, the rooftop of our building. This is the extension on our adjacent building. And uh, I think that pretty much sums things up. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll take testimony and we'll come back to you. Okay, um, Irene Van Slyke. Sorry? Garrett Lynch goes first. Okay, Garrett Lynch. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Garrett Lynch. Uh, Irene and I are both neighbors. Um, I live at 208 Bourbon Street, uh, the building immediately uh, to the east of 206A, and Irene and her husband Richard and his wife uh, live at 206 Bourbon Street. Um, I live with my wife and three children. Um, so the, together, the two of us live on either side of this uh, proposed project. Um, which, as indicated, is part of a, a, a really unique row of 10 identical matching houses, which are called out in the designation report as being, quote, remarkably intact examples of the architecture and character of this neighborhood, period. Um, I have limited time, so I'll get right to the point. Um, we, as neighbors on either side of this building, and also as members of the larger community, strongly oppose these proposed extensions. Uh, and urge the Landmarks Preservation Commission to disapprove them. Um, we think they are totally inappropriate and out of scale, predominantly, with everything else in this row of matching homes, and we think the cumulative impact would be to entirely and totally overwhelm the neighboring homes and all of the homes um, in this row, and potentially fundamentally alter the character of this block and district if massive expansions like this were allowed on every single home in the district, which we believe is the entire point of the designation of this district. In the first instance, is to prevent pretty substantial uh, additions and expansions like this that absolutely overwhelm and swallow the neighboring homes um, and destroy the unique character and fabric of our neighborhood. And to be very clear, we don't, this isn't a knee-jerk thing. We don't unreasonably oppose any expansion that is modest and reasonable in scope mass and nature. Uh, we simply oppose this as being entirely unreasonable and we believe irresponsible uh, for reasons that I'll explain. First, uh, as this shows, this is no modest expansion. This is a 16 foot deep, four story high rear expansion, full width, almost full roof expansion on the top. Uh, these buildings aren't are somewhat modest in size. They share a single brick party wall, so we don't think that a full width rooftop extension would be appropriate for buildings that share 150-year-old brick party walls. 
Um, and there's absolutely nothing like this or even approaching it on this block. Um, there have been some minor um, additions, as indicated, a four foot deep elevator um, to accommodate Irene's husband, um, as well as the predominant rear extension is our six or eight foot decks uh, that, that protrude from the original party, uh, original walls. There's nothing like a 16 foot deep, four story high, massive uh, extension. And again, we think the cumulative impact will be to completely overwhelm and swallow up the neighboring buildings. Um, the only examples provided of anything remotely similar aren't in this row, uh, notably, and also um, were designed and built prior to designation, shockingly. Again, the whole point of designation is to not have the, the massive behemoth building that was built behind us on Wyckoff Street, um, completely fundamentally altering the nature of, of this neighborhood and district. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the, the bell has gone off, so okay. your time is up if you want to just make one final sure I, I i believe that i mean do, do you want to see time or do you want me to continue or do you want to okay so i think i mean I just, I, if, if i may have our means time as well i think i'll is that is that allowed was that permissible or no that's okay okay thank you um but thank you. I, I i i do have a, a letter detailing this and some some exhibits and examples uh because what I'll get to next, I think, is also critically important, although not as within the bailiwick of the Landmarks Commission, which is why this would also be irresponsible. Um, this developer has demonstrated a consistent lack of interest in abiding by the rules, norms, regulations, governing responsible development in New York City. Um, after purchasing this property under circumstances that were the subject of protracted litigation, after a guardian was appointed for the prior owner of the building, um, he immediately embarked on demolition, full-scale demolition of the interior of this building and rear exterior with zero permits. That the, rear, the upper right of the photos that show that, that was, that was uh, replaced, the upper rear floor, existing rear wall was ripped off. We came home to find bricks in our backyard where my small children play every single day. There were bricks in the yard where this rear uh, wall was ripped off. Um, there's good reason why a stop work order is imposed on this building and why there are escalating and mounting department uh, building violations that have been unpaid, unresolved, unresponded to. And we believe it's because the owner and developer has no interest in maintaining the integrity of this district or also the safety of its neighbors. So whatever happens, we think it needs, whatever occurs at this property needs to be monitored uh, very closely. Um, Ultimately, our interest is in preserving the character and unique nature of our row of houses and our block. Um, we strongly oppose the proposed expansion. Um, and at a minimum, a bare minimum, we think it should be reduced substantially in scale from 16 feet deep, full story, full width rooftop, and so forth. Um, and I think this is a prime example of what was alluded to earlier by some of the commissioners of it isn't just about visibility from the street, it's about cumulative impact. And we think the cumulative impact of this proposed expansion would be to absolutely overwhelm all of the neighboring properties and potentially uh, really harm the unique character of this district. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do I submit this now or? Thanks. Okay, the next speaker is Lauren Stern Schwartz. Hi, I'm Lauren Stern Schwartz on behalf of the Borough of Ellis. I have a letter here, but it, it very much echoes what the neighbors have already said. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. I believe we've already submitted submitted it to you. Um, we object to the extension. Uh, it's in this house is part of the historic district now, the newly completed historic district. The building is part of an unbroken row of ten brownstones, and the proposal should clearly address the historic context by outlining plans to match the adjacent facades. The rooftop and full height rear addition are overly large, out of scale, and inconsistent with the other additions nearby. And the rest of the letter you already have. Thank you. Jesse Ditto. Jesse Ditto for the Historic District Council. Uh, this just here applies the restoration work taking place at the building's front facade, but we are given pause by the bulk of the rear of the addition, which seems excessive for this row of matching brownstone row houses. And as whenever applications like this come before the commission, we ask you to reduce the height of the rear addition and set back the roof addition from the rear facade. 
In order to retain the original top floor windows and cornice line, you retain some eligibility of the original structure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommending disapproval of the application. John, would you like to respond to the comments? Thank you, yes, I would. Um, I, I first want to point out that um, we made two presentations to um, the community board. Um, the first presentation um, had, a, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I won't be able to speak to any of the history that uh, neighbors spoke about. There was a previous engineer who had done the original design. I was only retained just this past year to try to work through a landmark acceptable corporation. So, um, but with respect to um, our work, we went to the community board and originally proposed a, um, a mansard roof addition. Um, sort of expected it wasn't going to do so well, but uh, nevertheless, we at that point had this setback here. Um, then in discussions with the developer, we went back the second time in February to um, uh, set this back so that it wouldn't be visible. Um, but uh, we set it all the way back, and you've heard many of them speak about this four-story full-height addition. That is what the community board last saw. And I was uh, in contact with Rob Harris, explaining to him that we were going to go ahead with this presentation, but that we made modifications to incorporate both the comments from the first January meeting as well as the February meeting. The February meeting generally didn't object, uh, given that this was a result from the street, and the January meeting. Uh, there wasn't a resolution issued because uh, they did not, um, uh, uh, this, this wasn't uh, calendar yet, but um, it said motion to disprove is presented with comments that the committee objects to the additional story, that man's are, um, but not to the rear addition. And the vote was seven to one to two abstentions. And so what we did was we took the comments to heart from the first January meeting and revise this design to eliminate the full height, uh, I agree, rather massive extension, and uh, make this extension now just align with the uh, cornice lines in the adjacent building. So I just wanted to make that clear why there were those comments that were calling a full height petition. Um, and I, one other thing, I mean, I know there was a comment about the width of the extension on the, the roof. I mean, it isn't visible, first of all, but, but more importantly, um, the bearing walls. There was an implication that structurally they may not be sufficient, but uh, they are. Thank you. Okay. Any final questions? Yeah. Can I, can I just ask Andy a, a question about the uh, a comment that the uh, that was made in the testimony about the that the modifications that are being used to uh, 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 the modifications on the block that are uh, being used by the applicant to uh, bolster. No, so this is the uh, extension that was designated in 2017, uh, and so the examples come from other properties in the extension, and none of the work has been for the commission. Thanks. None of the work has been what? Approved by the commission, because this is the broad hill extension that we recently yeah. designated, so they were built prior to designation. <coughs> And, and in this particular row, Amy, there are, um, there's the one addition with the elevator to the, yeah, to the immediate, to the immediate left, right. and then there was another thing again until the end of the block. Right? Yes, so this is the house with the, the uh, full like, elevator addition at the rear, and then I just want to go back to the block plan. So you can see that they, uh, are scattered throughout the block, but nothing in the Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, motion to close the hearing. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So, discussion. Michael? Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, uh, I bet if, if we showed the rendering of the uh, 3D in the backyard, and either one of them, the volumetric or the rendering group, this architect knows better. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I don't see, I, you know, when you're using uh, uh, 
projects that have not been reviewed by the commission as a basis, and where your photographs and renderings themselves just shout about an appropriate scale. I don't see how, you know, come on, doesn't work. <laughs> I think you have a very uh, remarkably intact row where the volumetric expression of that row at the back and the front and the top is very clear. But it gets closer to that, so stick with it. I, I, I think you could, uh, I think an argument could be made for a deeper extension on the cellar level. I think an argument could be made for a more sturdy addition on the basement level. I think that, um, uh, I, I think that that's about it. And uh, what about if you were to separate, as we would normally acquire the rooftop addition from the rear yard addition, lower the rear yard addition? My well, personal feeling is that, over your, my, top? Yeah, my personal feeling is, as I said, you're ready. <laughs> is that when, when you have a very uh, significant intact block uh, that, that uh, rooftop additions are you know, not, uh, not something that I would find appropriate even if it were not visible. Uh, I'd have to go back and look again. And this block did have a little bit of fair variety in height. I, I think I need a little bit more ammo to help me understand why this was okay. But um, yeah, I don't think we're going too far with this. Okay. John, I, I, I think I agree with Michael in every way. I, I in starting with uh, pointing out exactly the uh, pieces of the presentation that that just screamed out um, inappropriate. Um, you know, there is no masking the, um, the immense volume compared to the uh, current uh, existing uh, building. Uh, and I also agree with him on the uh, on the rooftop issue. Um, it is rare that we see any um, intact uh, rooftops, uh, matching buildings, or intact um, uh, donuts. And we've seen two um, um, today. Um, and I think we're, um, I, I'm in the same place as I was the first time. I just want to add my voice to theirs. Um, <clears throat> um, I know that we, the word appropriate is our our touchstone, and this is inappropriate for clearly. But it also, to me, epitomizes the word overwhelms. Uh, we use that word, and our council advised us to think about that as we look at particularly row houses. Um, so this is the epitome, I think, of an overwhelming uh, uh, notion about how to add. So it's, it's clearly inappropriate uh, at many different levels, and needs to be reworked. So I think, I yes, Jane. I, I agree as well. Um, I feel like that's though at the depth is it's too deep. Um, it should uh, work more with uh, the buildings around it. I think it's the addition on the back is also too high. It has to come down. Um, I don't have a problem with the uh, having something on the roof, but I think it's too big and it uh, needs to be made smaller and set back. And that's about it. I agree with what my colleagues have said, including they'll come on. Okay, <laughs> great. So um, I think that it's just you know, much larger than we would approve in, a, a, in this particular context where there are so few uh, additions and then they are so much smaller. So I think both the depth and the height need to be restudied. All right, thank you. We'll see you back. The next item is item number four, LCC 19-31261, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the building in Block 21, Lot 5, 18 Harrison Street, and Tribeca West Historic District. The utilitarian store and lock building with the number of style elements designed by Deputy Now and built in 1885. The application is to check the rooftop uh, and the rear addition and replace windows and store front of the building. Good afternoon, Commissioner Zabby Hill, Preservation Staff. This application is for work at 18 Harrison Street, which is located on the north side of Harrison Street, between Hudson and Grand Street, so at the Hudson Historic District. So there are several aspects of this proposal. I just want to 
we can show you the historic uh, tax photo here, and the EDS photo. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to, um, yes. So, there are three aspects. The first is the construction of a 410 steel clad penthouse, which will be visible uh, from the west on Harrison Street and South on Harris Street. The second is to replace the windows of the front facade um, from these single and one over ones to two over two metal clad um, double hung windows. In order to meet stack level rules, it would have to be a four over four uh, wood double hung window. And finally, the proposal is to construct a uh, two-story rear yard addition that will align in um, extension and height of the neighboring buildings on each side. Um, also, please note that although the replacement of storefront info was advertised, that has been removed from the proposal, so um, the info that was present at the time of designation is supposed to remain. Additionally, on pages 10 and 22, there's an error that notes on your hair pet. Um, at the rear here. They're not proposing that, it's really just uh, a railing. So, if you have questions, the applicant is here. No, 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 the details have just not been shown because of the presentation. So they're not proposing anything at the rear except for the rear yard addition that will align with the neighbors in height and extension. Yep. So here's the previous section. Great. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? You don't have to. Oh, let me show just the, the last part. The record? Jesse Denno. Jesse Denno for the Historic Districts Council. HTC agrees that this utility town and storm loft building could sustain a visible roof competition, but not the successively called 410 steel loft. The incongruous, the incongruous cladding material only accentuates the obtrusiveness of the direction. We also note that as proposed, this addition will disrupt the visible skyline very well preserved street and have to be back and forth short being building sands on the facade. We ask the Landmarks Preservation Commission to direct the applicants to reconsider the plan and return with a less intrusive, less intrusive addition and less distorting materials. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this application? Okay, we do have a resolution from the HAC Committee Board 1. It says it's recommending approval with the mutually agreed amendments, which I believe um, reflect two um, of their negative comments. One was about the overall height, and uh, the applicant has agreed to remove the stairwell head completely and the mechanicals to the rear of the structure. And I think they also um, had issues with the core tank steel, and so the applicant has agreed to switch to brick. So if, if that were the case, they would recommend approval. So I think um, we're not seeing a brick addition, and I don't know if you can speak to the mechanicals and the bulkhead. Oh, the idea was to um, the idea was to use quartet because it blended more with the brick, and it seems like we didn't want to mimic it blends with existing brick, and we didn't want to mimic a. Uh, something or create something that would look like it was existing before. We want to show something that that is really uh, that was contemporary and that was built now. That's why we, we thought of uh, using the port and steel, which we think blends also with the uh, context, industrial content. Uh, apart from that, we, we removed the ball here too because it was in effect very uh, it was massive, so we reduced the, the mass of the, of the uh, Extension, and we always uh, try to keep kept the, uh, the roof uh, addition lower than the building. Uh, and so the overall height is 
12 foot, right? From yeah. From the roof. And then you have a three foot six parapet right. in the same material, which same makes the overall mass look like it would be about 15 feet then, right? 15, six. Okay. Any final questions? Okay, well, I'll motion to close the hearing. All in favor? Okay, the hearing is closed. Discussion? Would like to start? Look all around. Adi. I agree that visibility is um, appropriate here, and if so, I think Cortez is an interesting response. Yes, Similar. I think Cortez is a great solution here, actually. It just may be a little bit too hot, that's the only thing. Maybe a tiny bit lower, but not a lot more. What do you think about a railing versus the parapet? You might see some mechanical equipment. For Michael. For our, our resident code uh, guru, uh, if you look at the roof plan, you see that the reason for the parapet is that there are mechanicals in a scuttle on the roof that's in the back half. So, I believe that it would be code compliant to have the parapet just start where the numbers three foot three and a half are, and that the whole front, which is where most of the visibility is, could have no parapet, um, which would not freak you off. And also, uh, much, as, much as we all love high ceilings, I think uh, a 12 foot floor to floor is certainly a bit grandiose, uh, even with the structure uh, uh, taking up some of that. And I think they can work with staff to reduce that to more uh, typical levels, nine feet or so, and that those two changes would give it the would give it the reduction in height that was requested. Are you using no parapet and the rail? No parapet, nothing. Good. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. If you put the parapet in the back half just to enclose the area of the roof that has the candle stuff, you don't need, you don't need it for the rest. You don't need a railing at all. Right. It's, it's uh, the only purpose for the parapet is to keep service people from falling off the roof. And if there's nothing to service, then you don't need parapet. But, but that, does that mean it would notch? It would notch on the side elevation, yes. Behind the line of visibility. I'm not sure. Yeah. If you go back to the rendering, I'm not sure you can see the Or if you, if you would, it would kind of fade into the, the mess that yeah. And so what are you there? Yeah, it'd be pretty yeah. much you. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I think it's all right. So, how about we have them work with staff to explore um, ways to reduce the visibility, um, including exploring, uh, eliminating the parapet and reducing the floor to floor heights. That way, if there is a very visible notch, staff can adjust and maybe work on the floor to floor heights. It's okay if that means okay. <laughs> okay. All agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay, in the matter of LGC 19-31261-18 Harrison Street in the Tribeca West Historic District, uh, application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and replace windows and storefront infill. I uh, note that the uh, building style scan materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Tribeca West Historic District. I also note that the historic windows have been replaced prior to the designation of the historic district. I recommend approval with a modification. Finding that the work will not damage, eliminate, or conceal any significant features of the building, that while the proposed two over two double hung windows will not match the configuration of the building's original four over four double hung windows, they will be consistent with windows historically found in other buildings of this type and age found throughout this historic district in terms of configuration, operation, and finish. That the proposed change in material of the windows from wood to metal will be largely imperceptible and not at all undue attention to itself. That the presence of a visible one story rooftop addition will be in keeping with rooftop accretions found at buildings throughout the historic district. That the proposed rooftop addition will be set back from the primary and rear facades and will be consistent with other utilitarian rooftop accretions on this block in terms of its simple mansion and material. That the cord steel cladding of the rooftop addition will blend with the color palette of the brick walls and adjacent buildings against which it will be seen. That the one story rear yard addition will not be taller than adjacent rear yard extensions on the block. That the rear yard addition will not extend beyond the neighboring extensions. It will not diminish the presence of the central green space, which does not exist on the block and that the rear addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfare. However, I find that the rooftop addition will be highly visible from the west on Greenwich Street. Um, I 
Uh, uh, therefore, I recommend that the rooftop addition be lowered and its parapet be minimized to reduce its visibility from Dredge Street and the window details be refined in consultation with the commission staff. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? So um, that's our last item for lunch. So we'll take a lunch break and we'll come back at one or you know, we after one. Yeah, try to make it. Uh, it's may be just arriving at that time. Across Andy's Road. Um, 
So the governor's house is an individual landmark. As Holly mentioned, it was built circa 1813. Um, despite its name, it was never occupied by a governor. Uh, that seems to have had some creative history uh, much later, around the 1930s to 1950s. Um, we actually know the building to have been built right around the time that the Fort uh, Castle William and the South Battery were constructed. And it's, it's one of the first residential structures on the island. Consequently, it's had a lot of adaptive reuse over the years. It served many uh, different functions, uh, including a break in its lower level basement area, a uh, commissary and store on the ground floor level, and actually it was the original house for the uh, commanding officer on the island before the Admiral's house was built. Uh, so a funny anecdote, the, uh, the commanding officer on the island uh, saw the Arsenal commander's house, which is building 135, kind of on the northeast corner. He's like, why does that guy get this fancy house? I've got to live in this crappy old house. And so the Admiral's house gets built. And, the building then changes function again for more office space. But I wanted to point out on the map that uh, when the building was constructed in relation to Fort J, it was originally like the front door of the island. So all the people coming to the island were coming right at the foot of Andes Road. So it's over its years, it's lost some of the prominence. Uh, up until very recently, Pier 102, which is just to the right, uh, was serving as a New York City ferry uh, landing point until we had some problems with our pier. So it actually has sort of become a more prominent entry point for the island. Uh, we're exploring some uh, restoration work to the pier now that hopefully will reactivate it in the future as well. Uh, the retaining walls, as Holly mentioned, kind of straddle this uh, very steep drop off in grade from the back of the governor's house down to Barry Road behind and then down again to Kimmel Road, uh, which runs along the waterfront. Uh, both walls mitigate the grade uh, between Barry Road and also Kimmel Road, which you'll see in some of the photographs. Um, so these are uh, some of the views of the wall, uh, starting in the top left corner. That's the view from Andy's Kimmel and Barry, where they all kind of come together, showing the upper wall uh, to the right and the lower wall to the left. Second photo shows the view of uh, upper wall and lower wall from sort of the southeast corner. Uh, third view is of the backyard of the governor's house. Um, wanted to point out while we're looking at that slide that um, the limestone blocks that exist on top of the rubble stone wall have essentially uh, acted as a barrier that Phil has built up behind. So now, um, while the limestone blocks have an overall height of about three feet, only about a foot and a half to two feet of that is exposed. So as it stands right now, this isn't a very safe condition for anybody to be in that area. It presents a fall hazard. Um, there were some trees that were located along. You can actually kind of see where they were chipped in that photo. Um, they were two London planes and an old elm tree, which we were very sad to see all three go, but we knew once we started working on the wall, the chances for the trees to be destabilized and fall either on the house or into the road were, were pretty high. So before public access season last year, we, uh, we took them down. We have saved the trunks of the trees in the hope of honoring the trees and reusing them at some later time on the island as furniture or some kind of application. Um, and then there's a series of shrubbery which will also be kind of removed as part of this. Um, bottom left corner is the southeast corner of the wall which was struck by a fire truck. I don't know if some of you were around when the Dutch house had a fire a few years back. The fire truck backing out crashed into the wall and kind of destabilized that whole corner. Uh, the middle photo actually shows the lower wall and an extant piece of historic fencing that used to run through the backyards. We'd originally considered using that as a model for the new fence on top of the wall, but then abandoned it at some point because it seems a little too, uh, I don't know, not the right direction, let's say. And then finally, the gate at the northeast corner of the wall, which leads up to the governor's house, where we see a bit of the pipe handrail uh, still existing, uh, as well as the, uh, the wrong iron gate. Um, the pipe handrail really is what's driven the kind of approach to this project. So we see it as an, uh, an extant element that, uh, that sort of mimics what was originally on top of the wall when there was a pipe rail. Uh, here's an elevation view showing three different uh, building campaigns, the rubble stone, the limestone blocks, the brick planters. I will mention the brick planters all fell off last public access season. They had been rapidly deteriorating, the soil was sloughing out, and eventually chunks of them were falling down, so our operations team had to remove them. Unfortunately, the placement of these brick planters, which we believe were kind of a domestic feature of the wall, that they used the leftover brick after the 36 renovation, not only to pave the driveway to create these planters, but what it did was just concentrate water coming into the top of the limestone blocks, got in between the mortar, and actually now has very much deteriorated the limestone blocks to the point where a lot of them are cracking or flaking apart, mortar is missing. Um, and then that in combination with the trees sort of slowly pushing the wall out 
has created this almost like cantilever condition where the, the blocks are sort of hanging over the wall in places. Uh, north view again. In this one, you can kind of see some of the cracking we're experiencing, especially in photo number two. Cracking kind of goes down through the limestone blocks and is into the wall. The other thing that's kind of challenging with this project is the limestone blocks are very thick. Each one is about a foot and a half wide, three feet long, and about 16 to 18 inches tall. It's a tremendous amount of weight to put on top of this wall. We're not sure why they did it. It seems that over time on Governor's Island, anytime they needed materials, they just kind of found it from other places. So we think this was just found limestone from another building on the island that then was reused to replace the limestone or the, uh, the original pipe rail fence. And then the lower wall is very similar rubble stone wall um, that has no coping stone but has the actual brick <coughs> planters directly on top. Uh, those are in slightly better condition, but again, we're planning to remove them and just put a new coping stone in their place. So this this first photograph on the top left is really what um, what is driving our uh, our approach um, to the wall. So the, the image on the top left is from 1896. It shows the configuration of the wall and it had a pipe rail on top. Um, brick, brick or cobblestone pavers were in the backyard. And you see the spectacular three-story porch that once existed on the back of the governor's house. Um, subsequently, this is a view of present day 2018 of the wall. You can see the damage where that brick is in the corner where the fire truck struck it. And then you can see how the, the blocks are sort of displaced. So the deterioration is in multiple areas. Some areas from water coming in from the top. Some areas from actual physical damage. And then on the bottom, you see sort of three different eras of the wall, uh, bottom left being the pipe rail era. Um, around 1907, that's the only photograph we have really showing when the limestone blocks were installed. And then a photograph from the 80s uh, with a really wonderful station wagon showing the garage addition. Um, just so everyone's clear, the back portion that you see in the upper right-hand photo, the garage, the porch, that little uh, bay L coming off the side, that was all added around 1936 during the WPA era when there was a massive building campaign on the island. And many of the historic buildings were uh, adapted or, or, or changed. Um, in this case, adding a garage, which is peculiar. Um, but it create, there's a really beautiful little detail with that arched staircase that takes you up to the upper level. Um, so we see this as something that, that in the future will be activated. I'm hoping maybe in a few years we can bring it back back, although I haven't gotten a lot of backing on the office yet. So. Have, have we figured out what the original material was for the coping from the top of the wall? We haven't, actually. We're sort of speculating that it might have just been like a, a concrete that was sort of trowel on. It doesn't seem to have any thickness to it, and it doesn't really look like stone in the photographs that we've seen. So we're, we're, we're trying to uh, come up with the best possible new coping stone uh, as part of this, this uh, new project. So. Um, one other thing to mention is the because of the way the grade has built up behind the limestone blocks, we are working with the landscape architect as well as an archaeologist to sort of change the grade there to sort of feather it into the back. Otherwise, we're not really making any material changes to the yard. The brick pavers in the driveway will remain as we'll do stone uh, curbing, um, and then we will once the grading is complete, we're just going to seed the lawn for now until we have a better development plan. Um, This is another site locator showing the, the way the wall configuration is. The upper wall is in the top, lower wall in the bottom, like the very road. A couple of the photographs. So this is our uh, concept for how to approach the wall. Essentially what we're doing is we're subtracting the limestone blocks uh, and, and the planters from the lower wall off. We're planning to introduce a new uh, cast stone coping along the top of the wall. The rubble wall will be uh, removed repointed and restored. Uh, there's some areas where there's some missing stone. We're going to try to source similar stone to fill in the gaps. Uh, we're going to be removing some of the uh, later pointing campaigns, which kind of parched over the top in places. But by and large, the materials are going to remain exactly as they are. Uh, and then on top of the coping stone, uh, what we're planning to do is install a new pipe rail. It would be a one and a half inch pipe rail uh, with then uh, stainless steel cables running in between. Um, this is in order to make the wall code compliant. Uh, you won't be able to pass a four inch sphere between the cables. Uh, we think it harkens back to the, the 1896 period of the wall. Uh, but one of the nice factors about putting a uh, pipe rail and cable uh, fence in or, or handrail in at this location is right now the, um, the limestone blocks are very, uh, 
opaque. So when you're standing at the bottom of the wall, not only do you get this sort of oppressive feeling of the heavy stone blocks on top of the rubble wall, but also there's not a real clear view through to the governor's house. So we see this as a way of kind of opening it up, making it a more welcoming space for people who are down at the lower level, and kind of uh, trying to bring people up into this area to sort of experience the view uh, once you get up there. Uh, the gate is going to remain on the north side as a feature. We'll be opening that back up once the wall is restored. And I did notice today when I was preparing for the presentation that there's a little extra section of fence there at the top of the uh, stone steps that shouldn't be there. So uh, just so you guys are aware that was an error in the, uh, the rendering process. Uh, so these are the uh, three different views of from the Andes Road side at the bottom of the wall, the 19, uh, sorry, 1896 view of the parade going up Andes Road. Uh, and that 2018 view showing the limestone blocks, and then our proposed uh, historic pipe rail uh, being installed on top of the wall. So now, just to point out, this is a hatch pattern on the wall. It's not exactly how it's going to look, but we wanted to show roughly. Uh, when I brought this to the community board, they were really concerned that we were going to change the rubble, but we're not planning that. It's just just a graphic image. <coughs> Uh, so again, this is another view of the wall, showing the 1896 view of the wall and pipe rail, current view, and then proposed view. So we're, we're trying to do the lightest touch we can on this. Um, and we, we believe with the, uh, the sort of precedent of the pipe rail that this is a good way to go that's going to create a little bit of transparency. The cables are a modern uh, kind of intervention that, that allow it to meet code. But essentially, we're trying to just preserve this and not detract from it in any way. These are some more views showing the backyard. Uh, we aren't planning to reset the brick. That's, again, just a, a rendering technique. Uh, but this would be the view from the driveway. And you can kind of see in the background the, the spectacular view. It's sort of an oblique view of downtown Manhattan, but, but uh, really a wonderful view up toward Manhattan and then also up the river toward the bridges. And then these are two more views, one from the northeast corner, kind of looking back at the wall, the pipe rail on top toward the house and another view from the southeast corner uh, looking along and up toward the waterfront the skyline. So this, uh, this is a detail sheet uh, showing how we're playing to detail the pipe rail. So as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a one and a half inch diameter pipe rail. At this time, we're planning on using stainless steel as a material, uh, mostly because of the marine environment. Uh, things just deteriorate very rapidly out there, as you can imagine. Uh, there'll be speed rail couplings, uh, which is consistent with other pipe rails on the island, and then a, a 3 16th inch diameter steel marine grade cable, which would tie the pipes together laterally. Uh, Cobra stone is going to be four inches thick. Uh, we're looking at a cast stone material that would probably be tinted in a blue stone type color, uh, and that would allow us to anchor in the, uh, the pipe rail without necessarily going into the wall beneath it. And you can kind of see that one of my favorite details about this wall is this sort of beautiful kind of step down that it makes. Um, those blocks of stone are really, they're, they're very beautiful and, and we're going to try to preserve them, but it's, it kind of almost creates a slight back to the wall, which is really interesting when you're experiencing in person. Uh, the lower wall uh, between Barry and Kimmel Road is much more straightforward. We're just going to be removing brick planters, installing a new coping stone, and then restoring essentially the, the, the wall. Um, a lot of the pieces of stone have just literally fallen out of the wall at this point. They're lying there, which is good because nobody has touched them, so we can just kind of take them and remortar them back in. Uh, but this we see as a uh, slightly less important wall. The upper view is from the east, looking down Barry Road uh, toward the uh, toward the water, and the bottom view is the western view, sort of facing the water. And then part of our meeting with uh, LPC staff uh, on the approach to this, one of the questions that came up very recently was um, other examples and precedents of Piper on the island. Uh, so just in the last few days, we've gone out on the site uh, on the island and looked at a, a number of different Piper rails that, that are extant on the island. So the first photograph is the Piper that protects the public from falling into the moat surrounding 4J. It's very simple, um, certainly not the code, but has done the trick. I've never heard of anybody falling off the wall. Oh. Uh, the second photograph is a pipe rail that's existing at uh, Building 125, which anchors the whole northern side of Nolan Park, so adjacent to the governor's house. <coughs> very simple detailing. Uh, the third photograph is a 
slightly different approach to the pipe rail, uh, almost kind of angles off in a little bit of a wonky way, and that's uh, Tampa Library, which is an NPS property uh, between the fort and the castle. Um, bottom left photograph is Building 110, which some of you may remember I brought uh, about a year ago uh, for a stucco project to stucco the exterior. Uh, that is a much more industrial kind of approach, so that pipe rail actually blocks the public from an area where it drops down full story, and in that case there's a chain link attached to it, um, not the most attractive, very utilitarian. Uh, and then several new uh, railings, or new-ish sort of railings. Photo 5 shows a handrail that was installed, we think, in the 80s for a ADA ramp that's no longer really compliant. Um, but it shows kind of just a basic steel picket with a round uh, handrail on top. Uh, Photo 6 shows the NPS Pier of 102, which is a much more industrial approach uh, with a kind of wire mesh uh, panel in between uh, a new galvanized steel uh, post and rail system. And then finally, photograph number seven, which uh, is Swanson's Landing, uh, our new welcome wall, which uh, there was a building there that existed before uh, building 109, I believe, which had a sway back, the structure had deteriorated and it was actually demolished uh, prior to my coming down like five, six years ago, I believe. And then as part of the West Eight uh, sort of welcome wall, uh, this new railing was installed. And it's got a slightly canted uh, pillar to it. It's very thin very modern. Um, originally we, we looked at that as a possibility but decided it was just too modern of an application for the wall, which led us back to the uh, pipe rope. I'll bring us back to this slide and that's, that's it. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? We will go to the testimony. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on this application? Okay. Um, we do have a resolution from Community Board 1 um, approving the proposed stabilization and encouraging the applicant to use in-kind materials for masonry wall and historic colors. So I, I assume that that maybe is because there was some confusion about whether the rubber wall was being replaced, maybe. They, they, I mean, they were really thrown off by the hatch pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, we assured them that we're planning to use all the materials that are uh, existing on the site to the best of our ability and then source the materials that are very similar to fill any gaps that we may have. Okay. Um, Can you just speak to the finish of the stainless steel uh, railing? Sure. I mean, we, we looked at a few different possibilities for this, and I think one of the, one of the ones that we had discussed before going to community board was painting black. It seems a lot of pipe rails on the island are painted black. Um, the ones at 4J that I showed are kind of like a, oxidized, they almost look like they're like patinaed green, um, same at Tampa Library, but um, we like the overall aesthetic of the steel, um, and, and we think it gives us a new element on the wall, uh, and very distinct from the wall. I think that that's always been our challenge with this project is, um, how do you interpret it, and where do you take it back to? And while we, we see the uh, 1896 precedent of the pipe rail, obviously we can't really go back to that just for quote reasons. Um, so what we're trying to do is take our cue from that and then make something that's thoroughly modern. So the, the cables are stainless steel as well. Um, as well as the pipe rail. Will it have a matte finish though as opposed to a shiny That's what we're planning to find, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Can we have a motion to close the hearing? All in favor? Okay. You can have a seat. We'll start discussion. Would anyone like to start on this? Okay. Actually, I was showing a little, I had a little tour of uh, Governor's Island last summer. Um, Michael put me out there. One of my first things to do as an interim chair was to uh, accept a, a tour. Um, so I saw this wall, I saw the, the, the problems with it and, and the, the change over time. Um, so I think this is an appropriate fix. I think it will come off as looking pretty contemporary. Um, and I was going through my mind, but we could have, is there anything we could avoid the, the pipe rail? And I'm, I'm sure there isn't really, uh, and avoid a rail at all. And I'm thinking that there probably just isn't. Um, so maybe this is the best that we can do. I think the matte finish um, is, is where I could go. I, I'm a little worried about the coping stones uh, not being real material, but, but uh, cast stone. 
I think that needs to be very carefully uh, looked at with, uh, with staff. Uh, maybe, even though there's been perhaps no evidence of, I think that's what you said, no evidence of a, of a coping of that's been there. Uh, I would like to maybe actually have a little material through uh, stone or something like that. And maybe not quite so regular. I mean, it, it, it's on top of a very rubbly, kind of wonderful rubbly wall and have this very s s straight and, you know, and, and um, pop popping out of a machine, so to speak. Uh, coping would be, would be inconsistent. So I think if it could be kind of a rough material, it might be good too. But again, working with staff. <clears throat> On page 14, I'm just wondering if maybe I should have asked Karen for that thought. If we can talk about that. So, on page 14, the, the, um, along the stair, it seems like the rubble wall comes out to a height of some, something. I don't know. Does it act as one rail? And if so, should they consider maybe the rubble wall coming up like, to the height of a, you know, a tall parapet instead of the pipe rail? So I, I think that um, one of the, yeah, I do think one of the reasons they wanted to go back to the railing was to be able to open up a view to the house. And so I think that uh, extending the rubble wall might have the same effect as the limestone that's there now. But it would be neater than the right. limestone more like the original. Right. Yeah. So are you are you uh, <laughs> suggesting <laughs> building the <Matt>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Michael. Um, I I agree with Fred's conclusions or observations. I'm not sure I agree with your conclusions 100. percent I think that it will look very modern and house may look very different from the archival photograph, which was probably copper <clears throat> to match that other one on the other side of the island. That Green now, uh, but I don't know if that's true or not. But I had that thought. But it was clearly meant to be a fairly utilitarian affair. The addition of, of the cables uh, is going to change it considerably into something that we all, and I think most folks, will recognize as a very contemporary aesthetic. Um, and I guess I question why the choice was made to go with a heavily modified version of a perhaps slightly more authentic railing versus picking up on the rail they already have on site, which is that wrought iron one, which I think would be a kind of a no-brainer. Uh, uh, it, it may not have been the original, but it's in situ now. It's, it's clearly not brand new, and uh, it would afford the view of the building without a very modern-looking uh, addition. Uh, the lower right. Yeah, the lower right, the gate, the, yeah, the middle. I mean, it's there, and uh, you said that they were thinking about it, and I don't know, I think it might have been a better call in the end. I, I agree with you 100% on, on the use of blue stone. Do you use the blue stone? Yes, if you want to, if you want us to 
do it or not? <laughs> well, yeah, so, 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 you, so you're, yeah, at, or so so you're not on the you're, you're advocating for that. I mean, we had we taken this through a previous staff review, and I think the general consensus was they're trying to make it look too historic by doing that. So, yeah, I think our preference should be to go with the modern at this point. Okay, so I think the question is, I can vote it out today with something that looks historic, or we could take some time, you could talk to the staff and think about it. Okay, we'll take no action today then. We're going to move to the next item. This is item number six. Public search 19 An application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, Block 551, Lot 3. 686 Broadway, the narrow road of the historic district. The building originally built in the mid 19th century, altered in multiple times, and the commercial site designed by Eric Weinberg in 1993. The application is the last of our current design. Preservation staff. Application is for alterations at 686 Broadway, an altered two story building on the east side of Broadway between East 4th Street and Great Drum Street in the Noho Historic District. The application is to alter the front facade, including modifying masonry openings, installing new brick planning, ground floor storefront infill, and uh, architectural details. The applicant is here to discuss the project. Thank you very much, Amy. And good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Elizabeth Torres. I'm the project architect for Evolve Architecture Design, and my team and I are here representing the ownership. Um, our client is a new uh, restaurant tent who will be occupying the building for the next 25 years, and they are looking to create some sort of environment that does pay homage back to the original photograph, which you see here. Um, and some of the rhythmic in the windows, some of the original fabric that we can try to uncover. Unfortunately, this building was rebuilt approximately 1999 as the photo was dated, um, and the facade did make a drastic jump in time, as Amy and my team and I have discussed uh, over several occasions. Um, these are the photos to date. Uh, the first photo that you see here on the left is the existing front elevation facing Broadway. It is kind of ground brick, um, which is retail style windows, very large doors. And this is the elevation from Great Jones Alley. Um, just a little bit of a historic back. We are in the NoHo district. We are right kind of on that strip. The building next to us is also under construction for a large residential project as well. We are within um, the quite discussed district of NoHo, which is quite still has its zoning resolution for mixed use and manufacturing and things like that and, and beautifully has established that both the residential and the retail and all those other wonderful components. Um, this is another picture. This is at the exact corner. So this is our building correctly adjacent to us. One important item to note is the we are trying to pull from this dark nature of this facade and some of the detailing to create a more harmonious corner um, from this photograph. Uh, and this is another building in the area as well. We just wanted to show that kind of um, establishment of that darker storefront, the darker metals in the storefront in combination with the brick that is reoccurring multiple times in the neighborhood. Um, and these are some other facades you see the darker bricks, the darker metals, the darker metal details. We, we really took our time kind of walking the neighborhood to try to start to get familiar with what's been allowed in the neighborhood and what has been coming and what has been restored back to the original to really make sure that we were as sensitive as possible. Um, so here, our scope of work, that's our entire facade. We are going to be are proposing today that you consider for us allowing us to do an entire makeover to this facade. And we did bring samples with us, they are here in the box for your review as well. Um, we are looking to do replace a veneer over the existing brick and replace all of the storefront windows as you see that. But we are looking at the triangular nature of the top of the, uh, of the parapet. So as you can see here in side-by-side -side comparison in our CAD drawings, um, the existing facade, and we really are trying to go back to that kind of vertical rhythm between the original photograph and the new proposed with our columns and our uh, breaking rhythm of the windows. Um, 
the building now has no distinction between the second and third floor. Um, so as we really completely that third floor on the interior of the building, you want to bring that distinction back both in the width of on the facade, the windows, both the vertical and horizontal in nature. Um, and if we go back quickly to that previous photo, just to give you an idea right here, this kind of, you know, the beautiful columns, the small detailing within the metal millwork, uh, metal work on the facade, we are trying to come back to some of that here as well and bring some of that material and fabric in the neighborhood in the back. Uh, this is our rendering. This is the original photograph, again, where we just want to show the rhythm of those windows uh, versus our rendering here. Now, our storefront, um, we are looking to put some retail and some merchandise behind the window, and we know that's also a concern being within that first four foot zone of the storefront. Uh, we are looking to tastefully just provide some show windows, but we are showing the banding. We'd like to do this, as you can see here, in our, the original cast brass revolving doors, revolving trim, um, and brass trim and details here throughout the transoms, which we repeat both on the second and third floor windows, and also brass dealing in the transom up top. Um, we'd like to keep that and, and put some integral brass, both brass and metal detailing at the top. Um, we also have the cast metal, our florets, our columns, and on all these beautiful items that we're adding. And of course, not only the inside, but also done in glass. Yes, sir. Um, this is this is the current beautiful photograph of what exists at 606 Market and its wonderful custom art decor. Um, again, in comparison to our rendering as well, as you can see, we, we are really looking to transform the facade of this building and try to recreate as much as we can and bring it back to, to much more glory than it is currently standing. Um, some details, both our architectural elevation, all of our detail markers, um, which we also have in the presentation that you can flip through at your leisure, and our back elevation on Great Jones Alley. One particular thing to note on the Great Jones Alley elevation is this railing right here. Um, we do need to provide some sort of guardrail for the roof. There is going to be mechanical equipment up there, which is not within view, but we have to provide protective railing for any repairs across the fire department. The building from this has to supply the railing on top. And on the front side, we do have some drawings with us. We've started to blow up all these details. Have you shown us the, the rear facade as it exists? Uh, yes, in an earlier photograph. No, not one at all. Let me go back to that for you. It is a very narrow alley, so it's tough uh, to see, but this is it, this red brick back facade, and that's that bump right there. With brick and with no opening. Correct. Correct. We'd like to keep that, so just put that protective rail in there. So that would all be kept in place? This would all be kept in place. The only thing we're asking in the rear facade is to put the protective railing for the fire department that they're asking us for. A very simple rail in the back. Yeah. And then we have some blown up details here of our storefronts, our elevations, and our proportions, which we have very carefully reviewed with Amy on all of our proportions. Detailing different items for the florets and the columns and the thicknesses here as well. Um, and some cross sections as well for the availability. We are looking to use um, the top transom to pull in some fresh air venting. And that is part of the reason why we've taken so much care in the detail of that transom. We both have the brass and the other detail to it. Um, we will be pulling in some fresh air and some exhaust air. So we're trying to conceal that from the street and, and, and maintain that facade. Um, and here's the blow up of that here now. The portions and the details and they'll be um, behind it. The actual louver material will be behind the beautiful grill work that will be done both in real brass and black and steel. Um, and this is just our, our floor plan, just kind of giving you an idea on that four foot zone where we had asked for, um, we were showing some display windows at this time. Um, and a blown up. So what we're proposing for egress, we do have a stair that outlets, which is that first fire door stair, secondary door, and if possible we'd like to provide something more fitting of the original time period of the building with a revolving door, um, and then our, our storefront systems. These are some of the materials. Uh, that we're looking to use, which is a uh, brick veneer in the deeper tone, um, exterior metals, both antique brass and the iron, 
Um, and we cut stone matching brick veneer as well. We did bring the physical samples out of the glass with us. If any of you would like to see them, they are here on the table for your review and consideration. When you say brick veneer, do you yes. mean a regular old brick that's four inches deep, or do you mean a thin brick that you're going to glue on? It's a thin brick veneer that we would apply on the face. Okay, thanks. And the coins are, this, are they the same depth as the thin brick? Or no, they will, they will protrude slightly. There, there, there is a slight prominence to it. They will stamp out. How much is an inch and a half? An inch and a half. So it's applied. Correct. We're not looking to demolish the whole building. We just want to go right over it for safety reasons. Um, that, that's what we brought to show you today. I'm going to have to take any questions. Go back to the red ring or the extra view of the color room. Sure. The total depth of the applique is at most an inch and a half? Correct. So the outermost window sill or molding. This is the most prominent of the facade. But, then, the but does, the facade. does the molding stick out even further? No, certainly not. So basically, it's either zero to plus one and a half, and that's it. Correct. All that effort and course takes place within that it's, much. It's actually coming in. So we, we are at our property line, so right. we can't necessarily approach past that property line right. any further. So the keystones on the side sit proud of the brick veneer, about an inch and a half. And then you have your storefront window detail, which then sets in slightly. It does not then sit no, proud right. of the storefront. I got that. But I, I'm saying, like, for instance, you kind of Let's walk. go. Let's go to the floor plan. Yeah. You can see here. The storefront actually sits just inside yeah. the edge of that brick. And then we come so back right out here. Right, right, right at your finger is right that here. molding. That molding is, this is, molding. Is, is sticking out an inch and a half from the current, or, or, or it's going to be how, how far out? That, let's look at the top, be careful. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that trend <laughs> sticks out. Okay, so the, that trend sticks out about an inch from the, the coins. Right, so, it's, so the total, total depth of the whole job is that three inches. About three inches. About three inches. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Right. That's what I want to do. Thank you. And then, and just to back up for the brick veneer, um, it was it's because of the CMU wall that's existing. Correct. Right. Yeah, we're putting it on top of the existing CMU wall. So you're taking off an existing brick veneer. The, 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 the orange brick, brick that's there has to come down, and then we have uh, to reapply that to right. the existing block wall. That's so right. wait a minute. So now I'm confused. So right now your brick is at let's say zero. Your brick is at zero. You, now you're gonna rip that off. Now you're gonna get minus four. No, no, no. It's a, it's a brick veneer now. The orange right. brick is a brick. Well, you said you're gonna take off the brick veneer to go to the block underneath. Right, but the veneer brick is thin. Oh, you're so, yeah, about so, the yellow, so the yellow brick is it's really also a thin brick. It is veneer. a veneer also. Oh, so you're just straight up. Okay, We're scraping off the gold <laughs> veneer and putting on a fresh one. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was, Sorry. Yeah. None of it is real brick. That's the terrifying part. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Okay, we'll take testimony and we'll come back to you. Um, Louisa Mitchell. Hello, Louisa Mitchell from Village Preservation. We feel that the proposal for 686 Broadway is a vast improvement over the existing conditions and we support the proposed changes. This includes the most recent amendment since the presentation at Community Board 2, which align most of the ground floor vertical elements with those at the upper floors. However, we believe the design would be further improved if this rhythm was continued across the entire storefront. As it is now, the storefront looks off kilter with the one misaligned column. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else would like to speak on this application? Well, we have a resolution from Community Board 2 that uh, recommends denial unless, one, there are taller doors and transoms over the doors and windows with higher bulkheads at the ground floor, two, that the third floor windows are smaller and narrower, three, the piers are continuous from the top to the street and not interrupted with detailing at the level of each floor, and four, the facade color is in harmony with the limestone and cream colored facades on the buildings uh, in the block. Okay, 
Would you like to respond to those comments? Sure. We, uh, we, we met with Community Board to on two different occasions. One or two on two different occasions. The first time we presented, the facade that you're seeing now was slightly different. We, we made most of those improvements. Having said that, the third floor windows, we did create all the rhythm all the way through the first and second floor, and we did bring it all the way down through the show windows to maintain that rhythm all the way through vertically. So we, the last one, in speaking with our client, they would like to maintain the look and feel of the revolving door if possible. Okay? Um, I'll go for each one. The second item was we did not have as tall of a transom here at the first floor. That was the second item we addressed. We came in, we put this additional transom line with the brass detailing and increased the height of the transom on the first floor as they requested. Um, as for the third floor windows, we have made them taller as well as the community board requested. So we really took their opinions into consideration. We really did try our best and work with our client. We were able to accommodate almost all of their requests. But our client would like to try to, to keep maintaining the revolving door that the elements appropriate with the piece. And we feel it doesn't necessarily take away from the improvements of the facade, which is the one off place column. Yeah, I think they also commented on the dark brick. Do you want to speak a little bit about how that fits into the district? Um, the dark brick is something that we find throughout. We took our walk, um, and that was kind of the reason we really took the neighborhood walk after our first initial executive board meeting with the community board. Um, they said there's not a single building with a darkened uh, storefront, and, and when you look right here, building right next door is a black and steel storefront to it. What about the brick? The, the, brick. The, the brick is a lighter tone, but that's only on these three buildings on the corner. Have we seen any older buildings with black brick? Um, well, this is all in black. Yeah, well, we've got some brick. brick. They're all a mix, quite honestly. Right. The neighborhood, they're saying that the majority of the neighborhood is in beige brick, and it's not. It's not quite a mix. You know, this building just went up. This is also historic. It's all rusted metal. This is the black and steel storefront. As you can see in this photo, let's go back. This is this is this is uh, not Great Jones West uh, West Third, and they just redid this building in all red and blue and red. So there's there's quite a mix going on in the neighborhood right now. Uh, so that's where we kind of we'd like to try to maintain it, um, and, and we'd like to include some of that old traditional more traditional brass detailing as well. Um, but that's kind of what sparked this whole kind of neighborhood tour to find some of the other buildings. And we found a large array. Of buildings and finishes within this landmark district. Um, projects. Um, we got red brick and beige brick. It was all over the map, to be quite honest. That's a great question. Again, I'm harping on this depth issue. Uh, you're putting in all new windows, right? Yes, sir. You're removing the storefront and the, the window wall above the second floor and the second floor, and you're putting in new stuff, right? That's proposed, yes. Right. Is there any technical reason? why you could not recess those further than they currently are supposed to be recessed. Apart from having put a little more flash in there. The second and third floor. Second, third floor. Recess, sure. recess that. Push it further into the building. Into the thickness of the wall. Yeah. Let's go back to the section. They're recessed more than the first. They're recessed more than the storefront. Yes. Right. They are recessed more than the storefront. You see, the storefront comes more out to this edge, but the second and third floor sits thing. on the inside right. edge of the masonry wall. Okay, so there is okay. depth. Right. Could, okay. you, could you do that with the storefront as well? Is there any reason why you could? Um, I, I could. Yes, absolutely. Thank <laughs> you. Can you answer the question? <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So who um, would like to start on this one? It's, an, it, it's a, a building that was identified as a no-style building and it is not one of the buildings for which the district is designated. It has, um, it once was actually a five-story building that suffered a fire in, I think, 1938 and the tax photos uh, was a, a result of that when the two floors remained. So, we're, we're working with sort of some existing conditions, taking off a veneer, putting a new veneer on that speaks a little bit to the remnants of the earlier building and has some new pieces to it too. So I don't know who would like to start on that. Fred. You get shot down later. <laughs> I just don't like this. Uh, 
it's a refreshingly different approach than we see so often, and I, uh, it, it derives some of its uh, design from the original building, which the uh, presenter made clear, but then takes off from there and, uh, and, and tries to retain, as I understand anybody probably would, the, uh, the bulk that is on the, on the site now. Uh, but really has reinterpreted it in a kind of a refreshing and different, almost baroque way, which I think their use of brass, which um, I'd be interested in what other, other commissioners think about that. Um, I sort of like it, uh, and I like the, what do we call that, template or something on the top. Um, I sort of like its quality of, of an artistic expression as opposed to just dumbing down to the kind of a re reduced quality that we often find appealing around this table. I think this is kind of an interesting approach. Um, with regard to the uh, storefront itself on the first level and the retaining of the uh, revolving door, I, I can support it completely uh, as it is. Uh, and then the, the use of the dark brick my guess is it's, well, actually we do have the brick here, don't we? Put that down there. It's a little black, right? Yeah, I see, okay. okay. Right, right, I see, right, okay. I know that brick. We actually use that brick. Uh, uh, I don't think that, the, that this building must um, be exactly what all the neighbors are, and I think most of the neighbors are. Uh, a tan brick, as I think the city is generally. Maybe it's okay to be a little dark, a little darker, a little different. Um, perhaps that's a little dark. Um, is it an iron spot? Yeah, it's an iron spot brick. Um, um, and then the, the issue of the coining. It's quite shiny, that brick, too. I think maybe that's not so good. Glazed and unglazed. Yes. Which is it going to be? It is going to be that mix. So it's a, it's a blend of it's a blend. Yeah, I see. Okay. Well, I mean, working, working with some blend, maybe not quite that dark is what I would say. And then finally, the coining. I'm sorry, but I didn't hear it. The coining is made of the granite. The granite. Actually, yeah, okay, good. Right. Uh, as long as it's thermal, yeah. Right. Anyway, that, those are comments that are generally supportive, I think, maybe tinkering around uh, a little bit with. Uh, working with staff, I would say, but I'm interested to hear what others think. I find this uh, to be very refreshing. I don't, I don't think it's going to be too, too self-conscious in this neighborhood. I think this is a, a really refreshing design and quite appropriate. Uh, I'm surprised Dr. Momo didn't stick around for the for tech on this one, uh, uh, but. It is, it is definitely a dog, and, and it's totally fine to have it extensively modified. Uh, um, I think this, could, this is either going to be really fun or really bad, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, the, the part of me that worries about it worries about the incredible lack of depth to the thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's no deeper than it top of the surface that we're, we're sitting around for the most part. It is incredibly flat. And as such, it may just look like a big poster. Um, so I worry about the depth. And if they can push the, the storefront in a little bit, that would be a good thing. But you know, there's only so much you can do. <clears throat> the other thing I worry about is the coloration. Even though I have no problem with the coloration as, as it's shown in the rendering, what I worry about is that you know, when when the, when the Great Jones Distilling Company moves on to the, to the Great Beyond and, and, and someone else comes in, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of flexibility to black on black. And you know, it, it's so not generic. It's so not, it's so much of a kind of a statement. I just worry that it's gonna prove inflexible. So maybe Fred's suggestion about Lighten up the brick a little bit, or do something with the brick might 
might let it be a little bit less uh, one note. Um, and I think that these staff comments about the coining on the, on the very top of those two little uprights, uh, uh, you'd never see that. So I'd say either have to be breaker or fully, fully stone, but not, not to say exactly. Oh, and the one last thing. It, it, they are such a historic job. I think that the storefront treatment should extend to incorporate the, the egress door. It, it'll, it'll lessen that sense of asymmetry. But they can do all that with staff. With staff. Um, I'm just reminded of the American Radiator Building on uh, uh, West 40th. And maybe look at the depths on that. I think that the windows and some of the details, other than like the little turrets, those have some real depth. But otherwise, they're pretty shallow and you know, could work. And um, and I'd say go for the dark, not dark, mm -hmm. gold, why not? But I do think that the ground floor should be that symmetrical. Uh, at, at least for the full width, but I would prefer something. Okay, are others okay with the revolving doors? I think everybody else. I, I do want to say that um, I, I appreciate the playfulness and the creativity here, but I, I think that the, gloss, the very dark, glossy, black on black, and um, it is a bit much. And I, I think, it's, I think the, um, and it's also very, very textured. I think the color should come down, and it should be a consistent uh, facade in terms of the color. I think it does stand out. The entire, the, the buildings that were pointed to were new. And actually, everything surrounding it uh, looks is very cohesive. So it's okay for, so in my mind, for it to, for the color to be a little different. But I think this is a bit much. And I agree with Michael when in thinking about its longevity as a building for future uh, uses. I'm not worried about the gloss on the brick at all because it is a textured brick and within six months this uh, on the street is going to dull that down. No, it's just instead of posing it off every six months. John, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay, so I, and I it's is a, it's an interesting district because there is a, a lot of new construction new buildings that were built, very, you know, kind of bold and exciting buildings built prior to designation, and then a number of buildings approved by this commission, um, which does, I think, vary the palette a little bit, and I think this is also an unusual site in itself where we are kind of working with this not contributing condition and, and sort of just changing its outer skin. Um, and made, it, it's very sort of specific to this particular user, and, and Maybe it's not intended to actually last that long. Maybe a different user does a different, takes a different approach here. So I think, in some ways, it almost, you know, I think its uniqueness it could also be sort of somewhat specific to this user and, and temporary. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, as a way to help an existing building fit in, I think it does it in a very kind of uh, contemporary play um, approach that's a play on the neighborhood. So I think we can make a motion. I think most people are okay with the ground floor, but I do think it should go the full width. And I think the revolving doors, I think most people are okay with. Okay. Not to drive the train off the track, but this is a very evocative. I know we're in New York City, but it looks like a number of distilleries in Glasgow, Scotland. It's just, I mean, it takes me a bit. It's really amazing. I'll drink to that. Maybe also just to address some of the comments about um, the coloration, maybe it would be good to actually to work with the staff in the field in selecting your final brick and granite and how they work together. In the matter of LPC. Thank you. 
6086 Broadway, Neville Historic District, the building originally built in the mid 19th century and altered multiple times with the current facade designed by Harold Weinberg, who built in 1993 the applications to alter the front facade. I know that the building is not one for which the Neville Historic District was designated and that the existing building facade configuration are the result of a series of alterations. The original five story mid 19th century above building was site, including the demolition of the top three floors after a fire in 1938 and facade alterations in 1915 and 1983. Uh, I also know that the existing buff brick cladding was approved by the Commission in 2006 to replace pink and beige granite. Uh, I recommend approval, uh, finding that the building is not one for which the historic district was designated, and that a redesign of this highly altered facade will not result in the loss of any significant historic fabric. If the return of spandrels indicating floor levels will allow the proportions of the facade to better relate to other buildings in the Lincoln landscape, that the proposed materials, including brick veneer, cast stone, and cast metal, will be harmonious with the materiality of other buildings within the historic district. That the proposed paired one over one double window shoulder window surrounds and engaged columns to call historic details from the original mid 19th century loft buildings at this site. That the proposed storefront is in keeping with the historic storefronts in terms of basic design, configuration, and proportions. That the revolving door will not project beyond the plane of the facade or create an atypical profile. That the installation executive grill work at the pediment will recall the hierarchy of details and ornamentation of peasants and furnaces at the building in the historic district. That the lighter masonry color, that, no, okay, not that one. That the storefront design incorporate the egress door that the depth of the infill be maximized uh, in consultation with the staff. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, so it's approved with those modifications. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take item number seven. This is LPC 19-325275, an application for a certificate of appropriateness of Manhattan, 519 Lot 226 Avenue with the Southern Thompson Historic District. An architect's part of the Dairy Style Apartment, designed by John B. Peterkin in February 1928. The application is to install a storefront in the building. Brian Blazon, Preservation Staff. I will be presenting this proposal and the applicants are available after the presentation to answer any questions you may have. The subject property is 210 6th Avenue at the corner of 6th Avenue, Prince and McDougal Streets at the edge of the Sullivan Thompson Historic District and across the street from the Charleston King Van Damme Historic District. The proposal before you today is to remove the existing non-historic storefront infill, brick bulkheads, and concrete ramp, and to install new storefront infill with operable and fixed display windows and a new entrance with side lights and transom. As is evidenced by the tax photographs, the historic storefront featured large panes of glass, solid bulkheads, and recessed entrances as well as multi-light metal casement windows at the upper floors. The storefront was replaced prior to the 1980 tax photograph seen on the right. The uh, plan shows that the northern, the only bay of windows facing 6th Avenue, doesn't seem like this is working, over, and over on the left there uh, on 6th Avenue, that a bay of windows is going to be fixed, as is the uh, northernmost bay at the upper right facing McDougal Street. The southern bay on McDougal Street, as well as all bays facing Prince Street, will be bifold uh, operable system. Uh, this slide shows the existing elevation, and the next slide uh, here shows the proposed. And again, the existing focused on the ground floor, again, as compared to the proposed. Let's see. Uh, a close up of the proposed elevation showing a fixed portion at 6th Avenue, 
The facade shows that the storefront will rest on a seven inch concrete curb and feature aluminum framing with a black finish. A new single entrance door with side lights and transom is proposed at the corner entrance. A close up shows the operable section at Prince Street as well as at McDougal Street, and that is also where uh, here there will be a um, a new entrance here that's going to be a few inches wider than existing and that will be for handicap access. So in conclusion, uh, or in summary, this proposal is being reviewed by the Commission and is not a staff level approval due to the lack of a historic prototype for the design of a storefront of this age type and style, as well as the lack of a fixed bulkhead between 18 and 30 inches. So again, uh, the applicants are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Slavo C. Wagoda. I'm Jeanette Klein, and we are from our Scotty from our office, and Toby Levy, the owner of here. I'm going to ask Jeanette to present it, um, but I also want to congratulate Sarah. Thank entry on the 6th Avenue facade, but then does not take inspiration from it for the proposed storefront infill. The windows were never full height as the proposed are. A new solid infill below the windows of a material more in keeping with this handsome deco building, along with doors more similar to the entry doors, would go far towards an acceptable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HTC finds this proposal to be a stylistically um, missed opportunity and that the plans need to be rethought to better integrate with the modern apartment building above. The tiny squares of the accordion full of storefront openings contrast partially with the vertical alignments of the openings above. We also object to the proposed glass doors as they detract from the solidity of the base. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we have a resolution from Community Board 2 recommending approval of the relocation of the accessible entrance and the removal of the ramp at the corner. And denial of the door and windows is they're out of keeping with the Art Deco details of the building, the neighborhood, and the district. Would you like to respond to the comments? Yeah, but you're the owner. Yeah. So um, we're again we're um, cognizant of the comments. We're asking you too. We appreciate your input. 
Um, we, our approach was to really kind of get the windows above and to go below. And, um, you know, our office has done several uh, door fronts in the area, so I, 15 years ago, so um, we're hoping that we can come up with something that uh, will be suitable for this. Okay, thanks. Would you like to add anything? Uh, Kobe Lohan, the uh, Honor Free Space. Uh, I obviously disagree with them uh, because if you look at the windows above, it's exactly what we took our influences from. Um, and also the current front door, which I think is a good point because it's currently like was thrown in the late 70s, early 80s. It's just a piece of glass. It has, you know, it doesn't speak to the building either. So it just seems to be a very odd objection. Uh, I also think that on the restaurants, just down the street called that 199 Prince called Little Prince. All the beautiful flowers outside. Uh, we have a pretty good history of turning really ugly buildings into something uh, that is really something part of the neighborhood. Um, we did that, the building before was hideous. Um, and uh, so we to do something similar here with this. And also, you know, in, in the last couple of years, because the park up down across the street, we do think that this opening doors does speak very well to that as people congregate across the street. Is a very sort of Parisian style of people being able to sit across from the park and then sit outside. We also do have another seating um, where people have there, so we think it all it comes together very well for that corner. And at Little Prince, you also have a multi light configuration. Is that the same material and detailing that you would be using here? I think those are wrought iron, but we're, so we're using something a little different, but the look is, is similar. Any other questions, Adi? No. No? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we'll have a motion to close the hearing. Second. All in favor? Okay, hearing is closed. Uh, would you like to start? Um, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but just promise we have to get a back by a meal still. <laughs> yes, I guess. No. <laughs> the, the biggest drag about Suena is that the windows were tinted, so it was so not inspiring. Anyway, but the food is always good. Um, so, I'm confused about a little bit about the, the I have to say the, the existing, the historic storefront is not clear to me, or ground floor is not clear to me anyway. So I'm, um, I, I, which is why I'm not necessarily opposed to their proposal, which at least seems to be in some kind of dialogue with the windows above on that short facade, um, in that it's multi light and they're sort of door like. I don't think that is. Or, or it's not multi light. It looked like it was. Historically, they were multi light distance. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm in support of the building. It's Okay. Others? Okay, great. Okay. I think you know, the multi light configuration, while maybe it wasn't historically at this corner, is consistent with the multi light windows that were part of the Art Deco style. And maybe eventually someday those will come back on the upper floors. Okay, so I think we're all fine with that, so Michael. Okay, regarding 210 6th Avenue and the Sullivan Thompson Historic District, the applications can install start and fill. I know that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are on the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Sullivan Thompson Historic District. That would make approval, finding the removal of the existing model start and fill that fall in the concrete ramp will not eliminate any significant architectural features. I the thing about files, multi light configuration operation of the bifold doors. We call the multi light steel windows from the start to be pounded up the floors. This is our deck board modern style building. For the materials and finishes, some profiles, proportions, and repairs. Composition of the proposed aluminum storefront infill, including operable and fixed display windows, single entrance door with side lights and transom, all with black finish, will be consistent with the storefront's found adults of this style and age. But the temporary voids, which will be created when the bifold windows are open at select and their locations will be moderate in size and will occur between wide masonry piers and will be in keeping with the character of the very modern storefront conditions, including bifold doors, found throughout the section of six seven of the work will enhance the special architectural and historic character of the building and the historic district. Second. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is item number eight. LPC 19-34085, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Grove of Manhattan, Block 592, Lot 78, 121 Washington Place in Greenwich Village Historic District. The row house, originally built in 1831, and altered in the New George inside in 1825. 
The application is to excavate the cellar, modify the back house, and replace the windows. Good afternoon, Commissioners and Elizabeth Vega Preservation staff. This item is 121 Washington Place, located on the north side of the street between 6th Avenue and Grove Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. The Commissioners are reviewing this item today for proposed work at the rear facade of the Indian House, work at the existing back house, which dates to circa 1912, and below grade excavation to connect the main house to the back house. At the rear of the main house, the proposed work includes the replacement of flooded glass windows and doors at the first floor, as well as the replacement of the top floor studio window. Both of these windows assemblies are defined as special windows for LPC rules. At the back house, the work includes altering the facade for the installation of the folding glass door assembly. And here you can see the proposed elevations. Below grade, the proposed excavation work includes expanding the cellar level to connect to the back house, as well as to increase the height. The commission will know that additional work shown, including rooftop mechanical installation and additional window replacement and modifications, are being reviewed at staff level. And the architect is here to further discuss and to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm Kevin Lincoln from Lincoln Architects. Uh, this renovation uh, is part of an overall renovation of the home uh, for a single family. And um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we're really here for five issues, uh, which I'm happy to discuss. Excavation of the entire site, uh, the rear fourth floor uh, sloped window, carriage house itself, uh, carriage house doors, uh, kitchen doors at the back of the house, and I'll make mention of a skylight in the carriage house which was discovered during the village. Um, it's actually a misnomer to call it a carriage house, obviously there's no access to it. It was built um, as an artist studio by one of the owners in somewhere around 1909. Um, I can go through the drawings, uh, like specifically locating it on the site. This next drawing just shows you the donut in the middle of the block. If you see, I'll point out one, just one other um, freestanding building in the rear yard on Grove Street. The building's been through a couple of configurations, originally built in 1831. Um, as a federal building, its neighbor to the west, uh, 123, is um, somewhat intact. It doesn't have its stoop anymore, and its door was lowered. Uh, around uh, 1925, the building was radically altered, uh, including the level of the, the first floor. And uh, the entrance was relocated to the sidewalk level, uh, right at grade in the center of the building. A uh, fourth floor with door and windows was added, and uh, that's basically how it appears today. And all the windows subject today is essentially to uh, restore them. We're not proposing any significant changes to the front side. These are various elements of the front facade on the upper two left slides. The other ones refer to the rear yard. Um, you can see the back of the house at grade level. There are three pairs of doors that are, have leaded glass and then a single pair of doors that currently leads into a very small kitchen. You see that in the middle and then in the lower left. Um, the lower center is a view of the stained glass windows um, in those three pairs of doors that are in the current dining room. And then the other three photos refer to 
the rear garden and um, that's called the artist studio, which is a one-story brick building with a slate roof and three uh, pairs of French doors. You'll see in the uh, drawings that there is actually a low-relief brick arch with a keystone over each of those doors, which you can see, which we are proposing to change. The main reason for these changes is that um, to take advantage of this captured rear yard between the art studio and the back of the house, our clients um, live very casually, they entertain very casually. The goal is to have easy um, circulation between the kitchen, which will be full width in the back of the house, and then um, the art studio. I hesitate to call it a party pavilion, but it will have a kitchen in it and they will entertain across um, the whole rear yard from the kitchen back to um, the party pavilion. Um, one unique feature of the site is that to the east, there's a full length uh, alleyway, which in the uh, southern quarter, about a quarter or a third of the site, um, is covered over by the adjacent part of the building, but then uh, it's open to the uh, sky for the remainder of the site. That's on the adjacent site's property, uh, but we are changing some of the alleyway. These are the plans that you can see in the middle plan, the dining room and the small kitchen and how they relate to those three pairs of doors and the single pair of doors. That's the next stairs. Um, and you can see that the proposed plan is a full width kitchen at the back of the house. That's in this, the middle plan. So you're excavating the whole backyard? We are excavating the entire site. And that is one of the subjects that you're considering. Um, partially because the client owns an excavation company. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea was <laughs> safer. <laughs> um, you can see on the fourth floor plan, which is the middle, um, that slopes the glass, which you see in the additions. Um, these are uh, the existing elevations. So I just draw your attention to that sloped, in the middle uh, elevation, the sloped grazing at the top, uh, three pairs of doors in the dining room, and a single pair into the kitchen. Actually, I, I should be more precise. The, the glazing into the dining room is a one pair of doors and two pair of kitchens. Um, and then you see those lower reading arches a carriage house or uh, artist studio in the back. The proposed are bifold um, metal and glass doors matching both kitchen and um, uh, artist studio, same size, same configuration, both symmetrically open. The uh, sort of glazing at the top has an awning configuration at the top of the slope sort of glazing. Um, because it's an occupied bedroom, it has to have natural ventilation. And then you just um, toggle back to the other one. Just to see back and forth. Oh, sure. Okay. So you're not changing the slope of the glass on the third floor? No. You're just changing the windows so you have some operable windows? Correct. And they're in portion. They're not, I don't believe that they're not in those. So where's the skylight that you refer to that you're going to be putting in plastic? The existing skylight is metal with cut glass, plexiglass glass panels. What what is that referred to? I think the plexiglass is there a reference to plexiglass? I, I don't see that. Yeah. Well, I, I, that may be an error. It's it's thermal in this one class. Maybe the existing is plexiglass. It's an existing skylight. With me, I know it's a skylight. Are you calling this a skylight or a window? That's okay. a window. Right, so it's a slope the, window. So where's the skylight you're talking about? The it's carriage. Oh, the carriage house. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. The carriage house. The carriage house. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, yeah. That was a recent discovery. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Do, do we know if this was studio of an artist of note, or is it just like? Well, it's actually, as far as we know, not used by um, a visual artist. It's actually used by a poet of some note. Okay. So <laughs> you're here, 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 here for the back door, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah although, when you go inside, it's, it's like a painter studio. It has no face in the sky. Mm -hmm. Yes. There may have been an artist in there at some point. For a brief period in the building's history before it was rented, so pre-1925, uh, it was devised up in the NSRO. Do you know who the non-visual artist was? Uh, yeah, his name was Robinson. The poet for me? I can give it to you. Uh, should I keep going? Um, so, in the uh, art studio, originally, if you look on the upper left hand photo, you can see we thought there was a three light um, skylight because it was sheetrocked over on the interior and roofed over on the exterior. When we did the demolition, we saw that not only was it wider, but it also has a dog leg in it and comes down the back wall, the north wall, about three feet. So we are uh, restoring that to the demolition and, and exposure. Um, this is a view of the east wall that's existing, and that's literally what is exposed. And that essentially remains the same. Uh, we just have some lot line windows in the and the cellar level and closed up some lot line windows at the upper level. The additional excavation is not visible in the upgrade. Anymore. You see that red line, that refers to the neighbors to the west who have fully excavated their site as well a few years ago. We're not going down as deeply as they are, but uh, that's a pressing it's impressive. They've, they've already fully answered it. This is the existing section. That's the proposed section. So, so and those are just sub -lines. So they connect underground. That's the actual intention. Yes. Yeah. To connect the two buildings underground. Full width of the site. And there is a monitoring plan that's been developed, um, and the excavation was designed by uh, Lang. Okay. Kevin, do you know anything about stained glass windows? Do they date to the renovation, the re um, renovation of the building of the back house? Um, they're basically reside, just clear, gray glass. Um, they are, there's a laurel wreath in the center of each one you can see. Some of you may know our work when we work in our churches, so we have some familiarity with St. Glass. I would call them handsome, but not of a distinguished quality. Um, what you might call secondary or tertiary glass, you might find in the parish hall or sacristy or something like that. Um, I think the main challenge for our client is that Obviously, in a modern lifestyle, they're going to be in the kitchen a lot, and it's difficult to see through them into the garden. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Can you take public testimony and we'll come back to you. Thank you. Louisa Winchell. Hello, Louisa Winchell from Village Preservation. 121 Washington Place was first built as a federal row house and later dramatically altered in 1925 in the Georgian Revival style. It stands today as an elegant testament to changing tastes and reuse over the course of its 188-year history. The rear house is very much a part of that history, and the demolition of its front facade with its three arched openings, complementary to the Georgian Revival of the main house, would be a terrible loss to this property. The same care of the historic details at the front of the main house should be extended to those of the rear house. Further, the application presented at Community Board 2 showed the original federal newels that had been at the front stoop prior to the 1925 alteration on the front of the rear house. 
The application presented today shows that those knolls have been removed. In addition to asking that the front facade of the rear house be left intact, we also feel that those knolls should be restored to their positions in the front of the rear house. Thank you. Thank you. Christabel Goff. Society for the Architecture of the City. Once again, we are here to ask you to remember the history of Greenwich Village when it was a haven for artists and writers in the early 20th century, when the people of fashion had moved uptown and the townhouses had been repurposed as studios and apartments for a more bohemian crowd. Back houses, some original stables, some built as little cabins in the then peaceful central gardens of townhouse blocks were delightful retreats. Seems only yesterday we were here to defend the back house that had been the home of expressionist painter Joan Mitchell and the publisher Barney Rossett. Those back houses were so attractive it begins to seem as if every one housed a celebrity. Here at 121 Washington Place, it was a poet as Jesse Denham discovered. <laughs> Edward Arlington Robinson, who I believe was also a Pulitzer Prize winner, so it's not just so old Robinson. This back house was built for him by patron of the arts, Clara Davidge, who bought the house in 1970. Her back house, with its arch French doors, is part of a romantic walled garden. It is typical of the village. A similar one, also with a back house, was, uh, was behind the J.G. Phelps Stokes house around the corner of Grove Street. Typically decorated with souvenirs of the past and exotic plants and stone containers, these gardens had a European feeling. In the publicity online, before the recent sale, which I have to tell you makes the garden look absolutely lovely, quite a lot of these photographs, uh, One sees these newel posts that the French Village Society just mentioned, salvaged from before the recent sale. And the back house in the advertising online is decorated with those two federal newel posts, salvaged from one of the now demolished federal front stoops. They appear in your historic photo of the two houses in 1920 in this application. Uh, Federal ironwork surviving intact is said to rare in this district, often the victim of unskilled stoop renovations. We would argue that the back house should be kept as it was unaltered. I'm sorry to hear it's partially destroyed already. Uh, and if possible, the newel posts should be left in place, having a second life in what remains of the old village. Thank you. Kelly Carroll? Kellen Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HCC implores the Commission to protect the existing configuration of the back house and main houses, and as we testified in January at a proposal to demolish a back house at 267 West 11th, the contributions of back houses to the cultural history of Greenwich Village is significant. Like the back house at 267 that housed abstract expressionist Joan Mitchell and her husband, publisher Barney Rossett. This property possesses cultural significance beyond its architectural charm. The property, as Christabel just mentioned, was owned by painter and arts patron Clara Devich, uh, an heiress who hosted cultural luminaries at the turn of the 20th century in her home. Among the artists she helped was poet Edward Arlington Robinson, who at the time was a decade away from winning the Pulitzer Prize. According to a biography of Robinson, Devage built this back house for him, and it was there where he composed poems that made up his book, The Town Down the River. Uh, moving to the main house, the, the loss of the stained glass windows at the rear uh, and their replacement with a new large boxy opening is a uh, loss of artistry. And HCC joins GBSHP and as well in um, investigating what happened to those dual posts and figuring out where they should belong. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay. We have a resolution from Community Board 2 that recommends, uh, it also breaks it into four parts, approval of the modifications to the fourth floor skylight, 
approval of the excavation provided that all regulations and protocols to protect the building and the adjacent structures be followed. Denial of any alterations to the studio apart from the restoration of the skylight. And that the ground floor infill of the main house be double doors or of similar historic design. Would you like to respond to the comments? Sure. Um, I would just point out that the, uh, we appreciate the comments about the new posts. Um, they were not fixed to anything. They were just loose part of the And um, unfortunately, they're no longer uh, um, not something that was part of our construction or um, I think that our owner is willing to discuss ultimate um, configurations for the artist studio. Um, I think we could live with leaving the three openings on the arches. Um, I think we would like to recenter the opening at the back of the house because um, it makes the use of that part of the house as a kitchen in its present configuration almost impossible. And it's really not suited to contemporary lifestyle. They really would like to enjoy the backyard, the garden, and have to be able to open up the kitchen. Well, so I think we are um, uh, very happy to discuss this further. Um, I would point out that we are going to uh, Great Heights to preserve the uh, back building, you know, the stone and restoring the slate roof. So we could make modern use of it. <coughs> okay. Any final questions before we close the hearing? Yes, Michael. I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to be a wise guy here, but I, I've worked on uh, Manitoba and the Russell Wright home up in Cold Spring. What is the contemporary lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think uh, a, a more transparent flow, an easier flow from interior to exterior. We really would like to use the garden on a daily basis. So you can well imagine that the whole rear of the house should be open whenever the weather is Seems like a traditional lifestyle. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, just, but, but more use of the rear. Oh, maybe I was missing something. All right. Okay. A motion to close the hearing. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, so there are uh, a few parts to this, the replacement of the studio windows, the placement of the stained glass window, creating a new centered opening um, at the rear of the main house, and then the alteration to the front of the back house. And you know, with respect to the federal, the ironwork that was uh, in the rear yard, I think, there may have been a picture that showed it. Um, this building at the time of designation had already been, you know, in the 1920s, after the restoration revival, style building. And um, I guess it's our understanding that these were freestanding elements that were not identified, obviously, in the designation report because nobody saw, could see the backyard at the time. And I think we're not affixed to anything. So that's, um, I think it's hard for us to contemplate retaining them given the, the sort of garden-like uh, quality that they uh, got after they were moved. But um, let's focus on the, the back of the stained glass in the back house and the studio windows. Who would like to start? Go ahead. I'm, actually, I'm okay with um, everything that's been presented, and I appreciate and look forward to a redesign of the back house uh, retained in three buildings. Retained. Yes. Yeah, I just want to. Um, I, I don't remember our improvement of the full excavation of the property, unless it was in a very unusual situation with the family just to be expected for a tenant. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That sound. You know, there's a buffer at the end. Never had a house. is the buffer. Corey had talked a little bit about our past approvals. 
Yes, uh, we've had a few situations over the years where this has been proposed. There's one for sure where the uh, commissioners did ask that a small amount of, uh, of the earth be retained off to one side of a passageway that connected, but it was more than just a passageway. It was still rooms kind of along that passageway. But the idea was something commensurate with that sort of five foot setback that the rear yards are often asked to keep. I, I do believe, and I, I don't know the exact project, there's another similar to this where the entire uh, yard was excavated and connected. And I think some of these have depended on the surrounding context. For this particular block, it's not like row houses with small or no additions. There are large extensions and uh, sort of courtyard facades and tenement type buildings, other building types that maybe some of the other blocks didn't feature. So I think we've done both. It's more or less case by case, so it's a mixed block. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I guess I could look at it in the context of the other blocks. Okay. Okay. John? Yeah, on that excavation, I mean, this is a, this is a unique situation. And it's unlikely that anyone else is going to have this particular configuration when it comes out that it would be extremely rare. So I uh, find it's full fully excavation. Any other thoughts? I, 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 yeah, yes. And I think it gives us some comfort that there's already deeper excavation next door. Um, so just with, with respect to the three openings, commissioners, if we, I think we can often vote this out and turn it over to staff if we have some guidance on if, whether there's flexibility on the infill within those three openings, multi-light versus single light. Yeah. Okay. Great, so I think we can do an approval with that one modification. You might have been watching by Washington Post in the Grand Fillings Historic District and application to excavate the cellar, modify the back house, and replace windows. I recommend approval with some modifications, finding that the alterations in the roof, facade, back house, and rear yard will not be visible from any public thoroughfares. The existing window on the main house is not visible from the street, but the slight change in material and configuration of this window will not detract from a special feature and will retain the existing size and slope of the window and pattern of the vertical lines. The delayed glass windows at the door and ground floor of the main house do not appear to be related to a significant alteration of the building. Therefore, the removal will not eliminate any significant historic failure. That the restoration of the existing wind studio window at the back house, including restoration and thank you, restoring the opening to its original size, will help preserve the significant feature and return the building closer to its original condition. That the block interior is varied, featuring rear yard incursions, landscaping, and hardscaping, and therefore the excavation of the rear yard for a below grade addition will not diminish the cohesive central green space nor alter the relationship of the rear yard to the neighboring yards. That the new landscaping at the rear yard above the below grade addition will maintain the existing grade of the rear portion of the yard. All necessary underpinning, repointing, ensuring the masonry walls of the building and the rear wall, yard walls will be undertaken in a manner to ensure the stability of the building and adjacent buildings throughout the excavation process. And the excavation is to be designed and built in compliance with DOB regulations under the supervision of a licensed professional engineer to protect the building's primary facades and the adjacent buildings. However, the historic back house facade features masonry piers and arched masonry openings that give it scale and character, and therefore the proposed a large glazing opening will alter this composition and eliminate too much masonry overwhelming the small back house. Therefore, I recommend that the three openings of the rear house be maintained in order to preserve the most historic masonry and original composition of this facade. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? This is approved with that modification. Okay, moving on to uh, item number nine. This is RPC 19 29857, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in Manhattan, block 1405, lot 60. 132 East 71st Street in the Upper East Side of the District. Our residents originally built in 1984, and five redesigned in the Federal Side in 1928. The application is to replace windows and modify the top of the street. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Lindsay 
Vector Preservation Staff. The item before you is 132 East 71st Street. Located on the south side of East 71st Street between Park and Lexington Avenue in the Upper East Side Historic District. There are some um, photographs of the building for your reference, including designation 1940s tax photo and to existing. So, this proposal has several components, and I'm just going to briefly take you through those um, before I hand over to the architect to go through the details. So the first component is enlarging three masonry openings of the front facade, as you can see here. And that's the proposed um, enlargement. Alright, there's the one. Um, the remainder of the proposed work is at the rear facade, specifically at the second floor of the rear yard addition, the fifth floor of the main building, and the rooftop addition. Please note that there are other modifications to masonry openings and the replacement of infill shown here, but those are being reviewed at staff level. So the second component for your review is the second floor modification, which um, will include the replacement of leaded glass windows, which are considered special, and the review of the level of articulation of that proposed infill. The third component is at the top floor right here, and is enlarging that opening. And the final component are alterations at the root competition, including reconstructing the existing brick facade with stucco flat brick, removing one bay window, here and altering the space window. And here are the proposed um, conditions. And the rooftop addition is visible <laughs> on Lexington Avenue over this one story building. So you can see that here. So I'll turn it over to the architect to further discuss the details and answer your questions. Thank you. That was done in 
1935, um, which pushed the rear facade back 15 feet. That created a uh, shortened rear yard condition and a very dark condition inside the house on the lower two levels. We're trying to open up um, the rear openings on those two levels, um, both to allow light in and to create a more cohesive composition through uh, the rest of the facade. So we can see that with the with the composition of the alignments with the existing windows. This is a this is the only historic uh, drawing that we have of the rear facade. As you can see up at the penthouse, the windows in this drawing are, are not the existing windows that are today. And the specialty window that exists today at the second floor, the, the lead glass, in this drawing is um, a different configuration than what's there today. We don't know exactly when those windows were installed, but we know it to be after 1935 when we this drawing. Uh, these are images of the bay windows up at the penthouse level. You can see from the interior shots there that they're modern, modern replacement windows. Um, although from the exterior, we know some things here deterioration. At the second floor, leaded glass windows. Uh, these are some detail shots showing the noted deterioration again of the of the wood frame, as well as just the poor construction of of the lead came um, from the time that they were built, um, as well as fading of the stained glass itself, um, which in those press, which are all painted on press. Uh, just to note also um, neighboring properties, uh, the one on the left is the property facing 132 uh, from the rear yard, and the one on the right is 130 71st, our next door neighbor. Um, both having enlarged crash board openings. That finishes our presentation. Any questions? Rear facade faces north. Rear facade faces south. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll take uh, testimony and we may come back to you. Sarah Camelados. materials at the penthouse level of 132 71st Street. So we also do not propose the lowering of the sills and the enlarging of the window openings on the third story of the front facade. Unfortunately, friends cannot support the alterations to the fenestration on the rear elevation. The removal of all divided light windows, including the handsome leaded glass special windows at the second floor, and the expansion of various openings completely undermines any remaining row house character from this facade. The expanses of uninterrupted glass are excessive and completely distort the scale of this elevation. Our committee also felt that the applicants did not include sufficient images indicating the rear yard conditions of other neighboring buildings on the block in order for the public to understand this house's immediate context. We understand that the window openings of this elevation have been altered over time, but we urge the commission to deny this proposal. We recommend that the applicants study an alternative proposal for the window dimensions and divisions on the rear elevation with that, that would be more in keeping with the character of this distinguished Upper East Side block. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Kelly Carroll. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the proposed work at the front facade and room to be appropriate, but we object to the loss of special windows, which will significantly alter the historic character of this building. We ask that the multi-light special windows be retained and restored, as well as the charming balconies, if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay. We have um, a resolution from Community Board 8 um, that approves the work at the front elevation and disapprove the work at the rear elevation. Okay, so would you like to respond to some of the comments? About the okay, any final questions? I'll have a motion to close the hearing. All in favor? Okay. So, you know, this is an interesting um, I think it's going to be interesting for us to discuss this because this is a 
rear facade that is, um, it's a designed and composed rear facade that's being proposed. However, much of it is eligible for a staff level permit. So we're only looking at the lower floor windows, the removal of the sledded glass, and the removal of the big windows at the top floor. So um, the, the rules have and, and have for many, many, many years allowed the staff to approve single pane windows on rear facades and to modify the size of openings to a certain extent on, on non-visible rear facades. And, and, uh, and of course, the commission has approved in um, new rear yard additions more contemporary facades, particularly in this district where there is more of a variety um, in the rear yard. So with that, I think that you know, the real question is about this leaded glass and the general proportions of, of these floors. Any thoughts? I'm going to ask staff. Um, is window number two on the left from the top? Is that, is that the oldest down? Is that, do we know what the vintage of these different windows are that one? I imagine think could be with the addition, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Another question. Yeah. That's okay. I think can we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because this rear facade is so random and altered, I think that they might get the proposal is reasonable. Okay. I think that the uh, the arguments about the windows being deteriorated is a little weak, um, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm still okay with it. Um, so would the applicant be willing to donate the windows? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the staff can explore that. Yeah. You know, and I think. Um, you know, we just the previous application we also saw a request to remove some leaded glass windows, and I think that um, you know I'm not sure that one we've been able to evaluate whether these have more quality to them than those did. But yes. <laughs> so are people comfortable with this? Okay, great. So um, that <coughs> The matter of 132 E71st Street, Upper East Side Historic District. Uh, <coughs> this is an application to replace windows and modify the roof top addition. I recommend approval, noting, um, first of all, I should note that the building style, scale, materials, and materials are among the features that contribute uh, to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper East East Side Historic District. I recommend approval, noting that the work will not remove or alter any decorative masonry or other significant architectural features of the building. That the modest enlargement of windows at the front facade by lowering the sills and installing windows to match other single six over six double hung windows at this facade will not detract from the overall facade composition. Uh, that the lighted glass windows at the rear facade are not of high quality, uh, are in a deteriorated condition, and have no meaningful uh, relation to the composition of this facade. Therefore, their removal will not eliminate a significant architectural feature of the building. That the rear fenestration has been modified and lacks consistency. Therefore, altering window openings, including those on the top floor, will not detract from or disrupt the continuous fenestration pattern within the row uh, within the row and will create a unified fenestration pattern at this facade. That the bay windows at the pink house are modern installations and their removal and modification will not alter a significant feature added over time. Uh, that the proposed bay window and single light doors at the penthouse would be in keeping with modern infill, infill found at rooftop additions throughout this historic district that the reconstruction of the rear wall uh, of the rooftop addition featuring stucco cladding to match the other facades of the addition will unify its appearance 
and then the alteration of the top floor of the rear facade and rooftop addition are only minimally visible from limited vantage points at a distance at an oblique angle and in the context of a variety of secondary facades and taller buildings. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That's approved. Thank you. Right, uh, to the last item of the day, item number 10, this is LPC 19 33564, an application for an advisory report, uh, Manhattan, Buck 1957, lot 200. 200 Continent Avenue, City College, City University of New York, North Campus, individual landmark. Collegiate Catholic Sky University building is on by George Post, and under 1897 to 1906. The application is to install a door uh, and alternate signs. Vernon Commissioners, Community Commission Preservation staff. The application before you is 200 Conway Avenue, which is a collegiate topic style gymnasium building um, located <coughs> on the City College campus at 140th Street between Amsterdam and Conway You can see the building here. The application is to infill um, several existing window openings at the northeast corner of the facade and alter an existing en entrance for their free access at the southern facade. The new entrance will accommodate for free access into the building as it will lead to a new elevator shaft that will provide accessibility to all floors of the building. The um, four air slit windows, which will be infilled with cast stone, um, are, will serve to conceal the interior elevator shaft at this location. And here you can see a section in detail of how the cast stone panels will be step back from the plane of the facade. There's precedent for other um, infilled aerosol windows throughout the campus. And here you can see the existing conditions at the southern facade, the existing ramp and entrance, and then the proposed conditions on the top, the top floor. The new pair of doors and existing line transom will be installed in the enlarged opening and the plaza will be regraded to slope up to the new entrance. The details of, of the door and transom will also draw from existing historic features about the campus. The architects are here to answer any additional questions. Are there any questions? Okay. I think we'll see if there's any testimony and then we'll come back to you. So, anyone here who'd like to speak? Okay. okay, so well, we do have a resolution from Community Board 9 recommending approval. Okay, so I think if there are no questions, we'll just close the hearing. Seven. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any thoughts? It seems pretty sensitively done. The opening you know, is very modest and draws upon other historic doors and entrances. And the blind windows also are, are sensitive to handle and also draw on precedence from the campus. Which is like a very nice approach. Okay, great. Me? Oh, sure. Did you step okay. you out when we went around the table? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. absolutely. In the matter of in the matter of 200 Congress, Virginia City College, City University of New York, North Campus, Individual Landmark, a collegiate Gothic style university building designed by George B. Post and built in 1897 to 1906. Application is to install the door and alter the sides. I recommend that a positive report be issued, finding that there are a variety of Great changes throughout this portion of the campus, and that the proposed work will provide barrier-free access to the gymnasium building in the least obtrusive manner possible. That the existing open door opening ramp and cast stone infill are not historic, and therefore the, the proposed enlargement of the door will involve the removal of only a limited amount of historic masonry that the size of the expanded opening will retain the same general shape and pattern of the exist as the existing door openings of the building, that the proposed infill featuring pier doors 
a castellum line transom for a call the collegiate gothic style doors and decorative features found at buildings throughout the campus that the minor regrading of the paving immediately adjacent to the new entrance will match the surrounding paved plaza and will be well integrated into the existing topography that the cast stone infill will be set deeply within the arrow slit window openings and will match the aesthetic characteristics of the historic terracotta window surrounds that the presence of stone infill will be in keeping with similar historic conditions at line arrow slit windows found at buildings throughout the campus and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural historic character of this individual land. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. And thank you, commissioners. Uh, we should note that this is Corey's first year. <laughs> He's officially in charge. We did. Um, uh, that's right. You're setting the bar too high.